All my dreams deterred from ever happening. So I said, I'm just going to become the best criminal they've ever seen. And I just put together these crews of kids and I would go into the raves now. Now they're fist fighting. He doesn't know that I'm there. So I kind of come up around him and I suck at him. Oh, these kids are f***ing scared now because I got their boy. And then boom, in the back of my head. And I woke up seven days later in Boston Medical Center. They threw me off an 80 foot cliff. So I ripped the morphine out of my arm and I'm like, I don't want this no more. So I went cold turkey and they read that and they read it out loud in the court to all the people who were like, hey, Mr. Hickey fell 80 feet, refused all narcotics for 30 days. He's like, that says something. So you know what, Mr. Hickey? I think you're all set. I don't think you're gonna be on drug court for the next two years. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I am here with Johnny Hickey, and he is a filmmaker, actor, ex-con, who's got a, a really interesting true crime story that actually leads up to him becoming a, a filmmaker, and we're going to get into it, so check out the interview. Let's start at, you know, at your childhood, like you were, you were born in, um, in Boston. So I was born in Boston, but specifically no. Charlestown, so if Charles. you don't know Charlestown, the section... It'd be like if you compared Hell's Kitchen of New York, that would be the Hell's Kitchen of Boston. It's this square mile on the north side of Boston, uh, similar to South Boston as far as like it was heavy Irish, blue collar community. Um, and Charlestown, if you've seen the town with Ben Affleck, which is- I was just going to say, that's, that's about what I know is so the that's town. A popular, yeah, so that's a popular crime drama that's based off of the guys- couple of my uncles included that were just serial bank robbers. They were crews of these guys in Charlestown. There was really no mob boss there. Like, so like Whitey Bulge was at the South Boston, like mob boss and went to Hills, which is some of them. But Charlestown was just like crews of guys that were smoking angel dust when I was growing up, like, you know, my uncles and stuff, smoking angel dust, doing blow and robbing banks and killing each other. Like at a, like, you know, for me to wake up in the morning and find out that somebody's mother's head got blown off was like not, you know what I mean? It was like that happened multiple times. It wasn't was like a rare thing. And so my childhood was, you know, I brought, was brought up in this housing development, the Bunker Hill Projects, which is the first and largest housing development ever built on, you know, in the Boston area. It was built for Irish longshoremen and veterans that came over in the 30s. And I think that's kind of what put the bank robbery stuff. Why, you know, so the reason Ben Affleck did the town, but never explained the why bank, there's more bank robbers per square capita than anywhere else in the country come from Charlestown. So like, it's like a statistic, right? So, which is like, how? And it was the IRA. I, I believe, you know, from my research that I've done is the IRA at the time needed money to fund the IRA. So they would supply guns to the crazy Irish guys in Charlestown and go out and have them rob banks for them, split the money up, you know, protect them, do all that kind of stuff. So, and then eventually it spiraled off into this generations in like the eighties and nineties where these dudes were just going out and just robbing banks to rob banks and make money robbing banks, like a heavy, heavy, heavy levels. Meanwhile, 49 unsolved murders in my neighborhood still to this day. So there was like a code of silence. People would go into like a bar, blow someone's face off. 30 people in the bar, nobody seen shit. You know, that it was that right. kind of neighborhood. Yeah. So it was rough, tough, Irish, mostly Irish at the time neighborhood in, in Boston, when Boston was still kind of in the 80s and 90s in the segregation kind of era, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, the other movie is like The Departed, I think. I, I also think. You, you, don't, don't, you, don't, <laughs> you don't like The Departed? No, it's, no, none of these movies really nail it on the head. I, I think the, ta the town's good. I'll give the town credit for sure. It's not as good for me because I'm from Charlestown. So the specific little things that are like, there's like a mob boss in, in the town. There was, there was no mob boss, you know, if you right. ever told like one of these bank robber dudes to like, you're going to go do this for me or else they blow your fate. You'd be dead. You know what I mean? Um, like my uncle Bobby, I was referring to him because he did uh, about 20 something years, like around almost 25 years for in the feds for robbing banks. So he was one of the original guys that like the town is really based off of. My uncle was, you know, a serial bank robber and ended up doing 20 something years. Um, but before he did his time um, robbing banks, like he'd get into fights with people over money, banking, you know, whatever it was. And like he got shot in front of me when I was, I want to say when I was like nine or 10. 
six mm-hmm. times. So like I remember like the bullets hitting them. Like you could I lived in the project, so you look out into the courtyards. And my uncle also lived in like a one bedroom in there. My other uncle lived across the street from him. So I had two uncles that lived right next to me in the projects. You know, it was this crazy world. And you know, you always looking out the window to see what's going on in the courtyard. And my uncle was coming home and he got shot six times. And I remember the bullet like would like you see like the thing like just like a flash and like something come out of his neck, you know. So like he was getting hit with a bullet and it was going in one part of his body, coming out another part of his body. It's crazy. Uh, he survived that. Went on to rob banks, do twenty something years. So that's all like pre his bank stuff. But that's the environment that I was being raised in. And then I had cousins that were doing similar stuff. You know, that same uncle stabbed my other uncle in front of me. But remember those Rambo knives? Remember the yeah, you know, like, the first yeah, the K bar with the compass on the bottom. Yeah, yeah the K bar. They call yeah, he yeah, filleted my other uncle in front of me like before he got shot. So like when I was like six, I watched him fillet my other uncle over something. In, in the so the, these are like just like these are memories that I just have kind of stored because they're they're intimate to me because of family and blood. But that stuff was going on around every hallway, every doorway, and eleven hundred apartments in that three story section housing development that I was growing up in, and then beyond the rest of the square mile. It was just always violence, and you had to fight, you know. And you, it's like you grow up scheming robbing stealing like that's what your that's what your environment is that's what you're looking up to these mill room i didn't have a dad at the time I, so i eventually find my dad but as a child all the way until my 20s i didn't know my dad so i had no dad growing up so my uncles were my they were my male role models and then i had a stepfather like that was like my mother's boyfriend that was just with her forever but he was a, a druggy mental case from another neighborhood so everybody that was kind of like you know, that I was looking up to was definitely like heavy into crime and stuff. So when you learn, you know, grow up learning these things, it's like, what do they really expect you to become, right? Like a product right. of your environment. Like if everyone in, you know, my family were cops and lawyers, then I'd probably be a cop or a lawyer or a politician, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but it was just, you know, it was more crime and scheming um, for my generation of like the adults above us. And I didn't want to be a part of that. I wanted to be the first hickey to not go to jail, be successful, go to college, you know, do all these things. So in my youth, like growing up from, you know, elementary school, I was bust. So that, you know, we have, we have forced Boston in Boston right. to bring the minorities. So I'd get bust from Charlestown all the way over to the South end of Boston. So like, you know, like a 50 hour drive on a bus, like through these tunnels and like, just do traffic in Boston to the South end to do the same thing back home in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. And then after I was done with elementary school, I got to go to middle school in my neighborhood in Charleston, which was good. So I was at the, the Eddie's in Charleston and I was involved in like science fairs. I was one of the only Caucasian males like to even like get in a state science fair. Never mind when I won a couple of science fairs and stuff. And I would also do mock trials where you go into the, the district courthouse and you act as a, a, a public defender or a, a prosecutor and you work with like a basically like a, a local lawyer and whatever team you're on. You have a court case in front of a judge. It's, it's mock. It's fake. But yeah, they have a winner and you, you actually argue with the laws and stuff. So I won two mock trials back to back freshman year in high school, sophomore year in high school and uh, was the defense one year and the prosecution the second year. So I was on both sides. And I've so all the way up that. until yeah, it was That's a unique kind of thing in Boston. Right? Like, yeah, it was a ve- yeah. It's ve- when I tell people that, especially people, some people from Boston remember it, and a lot of people don't. They're like, "Really?" I'm like, "Yeah." Fred Cephalo was my that was my coach both years. He was he was my attorney. You know, years later, I end up hiring him to defend me because now I'm a criminal. Right. Um, and so, which is wild, right? But um, so all the way through like elementary school and like the beginning chapters of high school. Even though I was growing up in Charlestown and, you know, single mom, all, all the reasons to like kind of fuck up, I was doing good. I was doing good in school. I didn't have to do anything crazy because I had all the cousins that looked out for me and stuff. You know, I get into street fights and, and typical things, but I was out of like, I wasn't breaking into cars. I was, I was like really kind of wanted to get out of school, go to college. I wanted to work, you know, be a filmmaker. I wanted to learn media, radio. I loved all that stuff. Um, 
and I was like really into into film, very young. Like would go, my, that was my escape. I would go with well, kids where I play street hockey, but other than street hockey, well, kids are playing football, basketball. I get on a bus and I take a bus over to where the movie theater was, you know, like half, you know, 25 minutes away, whatever. And I'd watch movies all day. I'd like buy a ticket and then I'd sneak into all the rated R movies and I'd go crime dramas, horror movies. That was my, that's the stuff I love. And I would pick the movies apart and I would catch continuity issues and like studio film. I was just very like heavy into that. And so I was like, Oh, I want to, you know, do movies. And then they did a film about busing in Charlestown. Um, it was a series, a mini series called Common Ground. Jane Current was the mom. And I got a little small pot in it. It's like an extra with like, I had like an under five line. I had like one line in it. And I was, I played her son who was like the lead boy actor's friend in the, a parade scene in the Bunker Hill Day Parade where I clap in. I like yell something. Yeah, go mayor or whatever. And every time they would um, break us up, into groups. So they take all the extras and like kind of under five neighborhood people. And they bring us over to St. Catherine's, which was my parish, my Catholic parish in the projects that I was growing up in. And then they take Jane Curtin, the kid that I was with her, you know, the lead actor boy and all the other actors and people, and they get in a white van and go off somewhere else. So one day, like after like shooting for two days, I asked the kid, the boy where I get on like a break. And I'm like, Hey, when they do the lunch break, where do you guys go? And he's like, Oh, we go to craft services over at St. Mary's, which is like, on the nicer side of Charlestown, the other Catholic parish. And I'm like, craft services? Never heard of fuck. I don't even know what craft services means. I go, craft services, what's that? He's like, oh, it's like where we eat, our food. He's like, and he starts telling me what they have over there to eat. And this is shit that I don't get to eat. For me as a kid growing up, like I'm hot dog spaghettios, like fucking right. cereal, bologna sandwiches with fucking chips crushed on. I'm like, nothing fancy. This kid's talking about filet mignon and fucking haddock and chicken salads and you know all these desserts and all this i'm like really so i'm like listen when the van comes i'm getting in with you guys don't say nothing he's like okay so when they did the break i jumped in the van in the back of the corner with him and just i like, kind of laid low went over to st mary's and i got to experience what craft services was so i already love movies and i'm already you know into the the arts of film and now i'm in this room with all these like actors and famous people and this array of fucking food that I like for me as a kid I'd never seen anything like that and I was like I want this life this is what I want and then right. eventually this is how the other side lives yeah and then eventually the walkie talkie start going off with the production assistants and they're like wait where and they're like because my mother's looking for me because I didn't come to the the other side of Charleston the church where they give us a paper bag with a bologna sandwich and an apple in it and a little right. juice drink that's what we get that's what we were getting right so I was like I want that so I had this hunger for that world and wanted to be in movies and then at 17 um my mother you know the thing about my mom being a single mom was I, I always give her credit and i think that's where i get a lot of my my fight in me from to like be above and beyond the streets is she was going to community college got her associate's degree at bunker hill then she went, got into suffolk university which is a big deal so she was the first First, she was the first person in our family to get an associate's degree. And now she's going to Suffolk University, which is a very decent fucking university in Boston. And she gets her teacher certification. She wanted to be a teacher. And so she gets a business degree, teacher certification, and she lands a teaching job up in Gloucester, Massachusetts, which is about 45 minutes north of Boston. It's this island in Cape Ann. And it's a different world for me. So senior year in high school now, I'm in, you know, in Charlestown High, I was going to Charlestown High. Charlestown High was like prison. It was like Charlestown kids were actually a minority in our high school because, again, forced busing. So all the, like, white Charlestown kids would sit at one table. There was, like, seven or eight of us. It wasn't many of us, believe it or not. And then, like, Dorchester kids wouldn't sit with, like, Roxbury kids. It was all neighborhoods. It wasn't, like, gangs. It was more neighborhoods. But the Japanese right. kids and the Chinese kids didn't get along either, and they separated themselves. So it was this segregation in, like, the cafeteria where you would eat, and sometimes there'd be, like, fights and all this shit. But overall, like, that's the environment that I was used to. And now I moved to a neighborhood where they got, like, where it's, like, the shit you see on TV as a kid for me, where, like, there's kids with jock jackets on, with their, you know what I mean, football players, and then, like, freaks with, like, green hair and all that stuff. I never seen any of that at that time. And Boston was very, very different at that time. So now I'm in this whole new environment. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I can do this. This is easy. 
and the kids in that neighborhood tested me constantly because I was a city kid, because I wasn't one of them. They picked fights with me, did shit with me. And one day I put some kid's face in a locker, smashed the locker on his face a bunch of times, cracked his eye socket, busted a bunch of his teeth, his face up. And the judge up there wanted to make an example of me. I've never been in trouble. I have no criminal record, no juvie record at that time or anything like that. I've, like I said, I've always been able to like kind of like fly through my neighborhood. Like I was a part right. of it, but I was always like the things I did there were never like we're looking for him. But in Gloucester, doing something like that, like a big fight and hurting somebody, um, they wanted to make an example of me. So they sent, they locked me up. They held me for thirty days, and I was at that time they put me in a cell with a guy who's on, you know, waiting trial for murdering his wife, although they didn't have a body. And he eventually, this guy ended up becoming the first man, a person in Massachusetts, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, to be convicted without a body. They convicted him on bone fragment and blood samples that they found in his neighbor's wood chipper that he borrowed from his neighbor. Yeah, right? So, so this is what, so I go from, you know, 17 years old, I can't buy scratch tickets, I can't buy cigarettes, I can't buy booze, I can't even enlist in the, in the military yet. And I'm in, you know, I'm in a, in a county jail, but I'm in a holding pot where you, it's just everybody. It's fed inmates, it's state, you know, people are from Murr. And so they put me in with this guy who was actually very fucking nice and like cooked for me every night. But, you know, he'd start to talk about his story and I'd look at him. He was a construction worker, dude. And, um... I'd looked in his eyes and I'd be like, yo, he absolutely fucking did this. Right. It's not about it, in, in my opinion, you know, just from the way he, he has that look like Michael Bobby, like this fucking, like, like that, like soullessness. And, um, but, you know, that being said, so I was being now, you know, bred with these, him and they with these other guys from my neighborhood that were like older guys, knew my uncles, knew my cousins that looked out for me, but now were teaching me the ways of like, this is what you got to do. You know what I mean? Don't do this. Always come out with your shoes on. Fucking don't wear sandals. Do this, you know what I mean? Oh, don't talk to this group. So now I became that for 30 days. And then when I got out, they gave me, um, you know, and that was to make an example of me, which is a bad way to like help a 17 year old kid who got into a fight. But whatever it is, what it is, and that happens. And then I get out and I just want to get out. So I take a probation deal because I don't want to go back for 90 days and finish this thing. I want to up, I, give me probation. I'll, I don't do drugs. I'll, you know, I'll pass probation. And then the police in that town is a small island. They just, they targeted me. So I'd be like cutting through an alley after school and they'd grab me on their mountain bikes and say that I was trespassing and hit me with a trespassing charge just to fuck with me. You know what I mean? Just, right. and I look back now and I'm like, you know, they were fucking punks because 18 years old, 17, 18 years old, you're still a fucking kid. You know what I mean? You're still like right. learning and growing and, and so to purposely like poke and do something to a kid who's not doing anything, you know, if he's in doing shit and doing bad things, like I, I get it, but like that, that's all they could do. So that, you know, 30 days turned into 90 days, 90 days turned into a year. And so now I became this. And, and so I got expelled from high school too. So all my dreams of like going to school for film and all these things that I wanted to do were now deterred from ever happening. So I said, I'm just going to become the best fucking criminal they've ever seen. Fuck these motherfuckers. I'm going to bring them on a fucking ride. I'm going to make this, like, this is going to be my ride. And I, you know, I built, started building friends in jail from other neighborhoods. So, like, me kids from this neighborhood, you know, my other kid from Charlestown that I was friends with that now was also, like, earning his stripes. And I just put together these crews of kids. And I would go into the raves now. That was, like, where I found my my place at one Point in time now getting out of you know getting out of like high school and now on probation and i would go to these raves and i would sell ecstasy fake ecstasy and you know uh fake k i'd sell strawberry quick as uh, strawberry k to people in the rave like hey and they're already all fucked up on acid and shit so they buy it they don't know and i'm selling literally quick for like 20 bucks a bag and and then i'm robbing people for ecstasy robbing people for k like robbing drug dealers for money just like with, with my crew and just like running rampant in these raves Robin thieving, um, counterfeit money. Um, so when I got pinched on the, the last thing where they basically at the end of the rave cycle, um, ecstasy started like kind of fading out at the, for a moment in, in, in catch tranquilizer and shit. Like it was very, very hard to get. 
and the Ravens were getting shut down, especially in New England. They were, like, closing them down, like, raiding them and everything. So people were doing these pills, oxys, these green pills that were, like, pharmaceutical pills. Like, and I'm like, what the fuck are these? Everybody wants these now. And then my friend's like, bro, I'm, like, getting, like, fucking 60 bucks a pill. And I'm like, 60 a pill? Because I'm getting 10, 15 for 100 packs of ecstasy, right? So I'm like, what, you know, what is the deal with this shit? So we got some, we're flipping them, moving them. Everyone's like, I, I took a couple, hated them because they made me nauseous, made me sick. I didn't, I was like, I didn't like them. So during this time, what a lot of people don't know about me, even some people that know me and know of me, know of oxymorons is like my, my involvement with Oxycontin, I wasn't really addicted to the Oxycontin. I was addicted to the benzos. So when I'd go in and get the Oxy pills for everybody, I'd get Xanax, Clonopin, and Valium, the V-cuts, the punch-outs for myself. Because when I would take my Valiums and my Xanax and a fistful of those, I didn't give a fuck. You know what I mean? I was I was fearless. I was just running amok. And everybody was buying these Oxys. And so then, you know, the score started happening because it's like, why are you going to rob a bank, right, and get a die pack, and you're only going to get like 10 grand, and you're looking at like tons of time. And... You do pharmacies, which don't have alarms, don't have dye packs, and you can get hundreds and thousands of these pills that they're pumping out that are going for, you know, on the low end, if you're selling like 100 packs, 55 bucks a pop, right? Money, bank. So Charlestown, my neighborhood, turned in from like that generation of bank robbers into a forced generation of pharmaceutical robberies. Like all the kids that would have been bank robbers became pharmacy robbers in Charlestown and then all the rest became addicted and then most of the people doing the robberies as well became addicted and OD died you know did tons of time you know whatever it was so they so were trying are to you, get I'm sorry are your guys are your guy crews going in and doing these robberies you're saying this is happening but are you happen- saying that everywhere oh my god everybody me and every pretty much every kid at my level of like um Every kid, like, in my generation of, like, crime and stuff were doing oxy scores, whether they were doing them in pharmacies or they were getting drug dealers. See, I would, I, what I would do a lot is I would be like, oh, XYZ just hit the pharmacy, right? So he's got a 1,000 pills on him right now. Let's tell him we need a 10-pack or a 20-pack or whatever, and let's go get him, you know? And so we'd go and meet with whoever just did a massive score, and then we'd take their, take their product, you know? Are you ever hit the pharmacies? Allegedly, allegedly, <laughs> allegedly, they allegedly they said I was the original, um, like ringleader of right. these pharmacy robberies. So they were trying to come heavy at me, um, and they had no proof. They had actually no proof. It was all hearsay. It was all people telling them and a bunch of you know what I mean. They didn't have me on camera or doing anything, and they never caught me after a pharmacy robbery, but they had tons of intel that I was like the original scheme artist that said, hey, let's go into the pharmacies instead of, you know, going into banks kind of thing. Right. Um, They grabbed me outside of an apartment um, up in the North Shore of Boston one day. I got set up somehow and I got caught with possession of a firearm, counterfeit money, um, and then like a bag of oxys, you know what I mean? Like a bag of pills and some other stuff. So how, they gave I mean, me. How did how did you get set up? Like who set you set you up? I still don't know. So this what happened was I was on the run. I had other warrants too. Like I had like a parole. I was on a parole, and I like told them to go fuck themselves. Catch me when you can. That, that's the attitude I always had. You know, like right. fucking peace. Like fucking let's do this. Run. Um, I was a runner, and so. I was staying at my friend. I think his aunt was an informant or something at the time. Something was going on with her. And I don't know this for sure, so I can't put the, the, the tag on her like that. It's inappropriate for me to do that. But, like, that's what I always lean to because she hooked me up with her friend. I needed to get a car, and he said he could get me a, a rental car. Even though my license was suspended, he could get me into some place that did, like, you know, rentals without credit cards, that kind of thing, cash deposit, you know. Right. And so this guy was coming to pick me up in the morning to bring me to rent a car and the, and it was through my, my buddy, one of my, my good friend, Mikey's, you know, his aunt, and he believes that his aunt did this too. And so 
I go down, and this is now I'm in a town where I'm not known. I've never been a, arrested before. It's a pretty rough city. Cops there could know who I am and maybe seen me, but the way the story goes is the guy's outside in the Cadillac, black Cadillac. I get in with him, and he's going to bring me, and he's got sunglasses on, and I'm already kind of like got this like weird spidey sense going on. And before we pull out of the spot, the car in front of us and the car behind us and the car that pulls up on side of us, uh, Violent Fugitive Task Force, right? So they pull me out of the car. I got all that shit on me, possession of a firearm, the pills, the counterfeit money. And so they got me on the car, and then they got warrants, right? And then they got the other guy. And they got him in the back of the car, and they're like, they're already like putting the cuffs on him before patting him down. I noticed that right away. So I'm like, you know, something's fishy with this fucking guy. I thought it when I got in the car with him. And then, of course, when I get down to the station where they're doing the booking, he's not there getting booked. So he was, right. in, he was clearly a fucking, you know, an undercover or an informant himself, you know. So, I mean, it could have been as much as like, uh, my buddy's aunt, who was involved in crime, too, even though she was a woman, she was, like, involved in some crazy shit. She might have not told on me. She might have told this guy, hey, this is this kid, Johnny. He's crazy. He's got pills, drugs. I'll pay you. Da, 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 da. And then he might have been yeah. already, He might have been working and, and said, hey, I this, and they might have been like, oh, shit, we're looking for him. Like, let's get him. So I end up getting grabbed for that. And, and they want me for, you know, they, I get questioned by. Everybody for pharmacies. The Secret Service comes to fucking see me because of the counterfeit money. And it sounds more elaborate than what it was. It was literally right. like in those raves selling fake shit. You get duped. It was like a, it, we all, everybody got duped. And then you would just go in and like be like, all right, I got 400 fake 20s. I'm going to go buy some stuff in the rave and recycle them back in. So the, right. secret, but the Secret Service. So now I got the Secret Service coming to see me. I got those, you know, pharmacy task force coming to see me. And I'm like, man, they want me heavy. And um, I ended up linking with this criminal defense attorney. Um, so I, I hired that original attorney, the one that I was telling you about earlier, the mock trial ones. And, you know, good guy and everything. And I don't want to knock him too hard. Um, but he just wasn't the right attorney for, like, what I needed. Right. And so this white collar criminal that I had did, like, one of my 90-day bids with that had this, like, high up-and-coming former DA – assassin, you know, Jewish attorney from Boston, Will Corman. So I end up hiring Will Corman for one of my like lighter cases for like an assault and battery or something. And he gets me, he gets me a deal. He gets me a, a fourth amendment deal with legal search and seizure of something. He gets me a bunch of stuff. And this guy ends up becoming my attorney throughout my whole, even till this day, um, for other stuff, even outside of like cr criminal stuff. Um, he ends up representing me a bunch of stuff for free because what I do is now I go into the jails when I'm get, doing my time and I, and I sell him, you know, I'm like, Oh, you got, you need a lawyer. You need to get this guy. This is the guy that's going to get you up. And so lawyers weekly did a story on him. And he said that 70% of his clientele now came from me, came from this one client that we go in. And so me and him became friends and he just legitimately represented me on a million things for free and saved my life multiple times. He's, He's like a brother to me now. You know what I mean? Now he's right. like my fucking friend. And, we're, and the fact that I do what I do now has made him so proud. Like, wow, dude, like I, I did all that for you. And like, look at what you're doing. It's, it's, you know, he's he's pretty amazed by it. But so I, I had him and I had all those probation, parole things hanging over my head. He's like, John, he's like, it's your second class B in a school zone. They want you for all this other shit. He's like, just he's like, if I can get you everything just on a concurrent time, he's like, I think you should take it. And he's like, and then we can make a move to get you over to the minimum because we, because he knew somebody in, in the sheriff's department. So in, in Boston, if you're driving on the highway and you see a sheriff, you can literally drive by them and be like, fuck you because they're not like a Florida sheriff that could pull you over and arrest you or detain you or give you a ticket. They're the, the correctional officers. So when you see a sheriff's vehicle on the highways here, that's them doing like a detail for the, the town or a detail for, you know, guys, doing pick and stick on the highway so that in the sheriff here is the warden of the county jails they're not a cop that like drives around and does it the, the police well, you're right yeah so we have police state police you know all the federal agencies obviously and then sheriffs uh they, they're who run the correctional facilities here that's it so that's it that's all they do they just run the correctional facilities with the co's okay. and details yep correctional officers details um 
and the sheriff here is like a political figure, and they're the ward, they're basically the warden of the jail. Um, okay. And so it's yeah, because you know, it's very different, so very different structure. Because I've been with people, yeah, the boss with me from out of town, and I'm like whipping up the highway, and you see this like sheriff's van vehicle with the blue lights on. It says sheriff right on, an Essex County sheriff. And they're like, dude, slow down, slow down. I'm like, he can't do shit. And you're like, I'm, you know, you know, they're not gonna fucking pull you over. So, um, so he, we knew some people in the sheriff's department, and I had a little bit of money from all the stuff I was doing on the side. So I was like, why don't we take some money, invest in the sheriff's fund through my lawyer, like you know, make a donation, and then ask for a favor. So I plead out. I take uh, thirty months. So I get thirty months. So this is probably the biggest sentence that I've ever done. You know since all these like little like 90 days, you know, I've did a ton of like 90 day, 30 day fucking bullshits, so, like in and out probation run, you know, six months run a year run. Uh, so now I get the 30 months, two and a half years, which is heavy at this camp. It's, which is where my brother's at right now. My brother's at this camp right now. And it's his first time at this camp. It's called Middleton. And it's just hell because it's, there's, it's a County jail, but there's no movement. It's, there's tons of gang activity. And so again, like I come from a place where, it's neighborhoods. So like you hang with your neighborhoods and other neighborhoods like you and you guys kind of stick together. Whereas like these jails have a lot of Hispanic gangs, like the disciples and the Kings and the bloods, and you know, they're always going at it. And so it's, it's all that shit going on there. It's gang shit. And so then you got to kind of like find your place as a, like a solid white guy in there because again, like jail rules are different than the streets and all this purple rainbow, perfect shit that they want everything to be. And then you have these facilities that like, we're back in time, you know, we're back in the right. cowboy days. Um, and there's just no movement there. That's the hell of it. There is no fucking movement. There's no yard time. There's a 30 minute gym run, maybe every other day a week, you know, the food sucks and you're just like locked down sometimes, you know, there's 23 hour day lockdowns and you know what I mean? And then when you're not locked down, you're just in a pod. It's just, so to do three years there is like fucking wild. You know what I mean? That's fucking brutal. That's, You'd rather do more time in a camp where you could like move around and shit, obviously, and go to school and, you know, fucking go in the yard all day. Right. So, so, but so I take the time then knowing cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to get me moved to the minimum early in my bid. So typically what you'll do is you'll go and you'll do two years of your two and a half year sentence. And for the last six months, you'll go to the minimum. They'll put you on work release. You wear your own clothes. Um, it's still a it's still a minimum security. It's got a fence, and you know. But this movement, and then you're out on work release all day, or sticking picking on the highway, whatever it is. The food's better, and it's just easy fucking living as far as like doing the end of your time goes. And then they help Do you, you end up you know, going to a halfway house. Do you end up at a halfway house, or so they can? Yeah. So depending on your charge. So if you if you're um. So at the time, it was only if you had drug-related charges, which I did. So if you had the drug-related charges and things like that, they would help you get into sober houses, halfway houses. They actually wanted you to do that more. But they would cut you to the street as well if like that, if your time was wrapped, when, when it was wrapped there. Um, so I went there. And so, you know, actually, so I go do my bid. I get, you know, I go in on this, this sentence with the parole. Remember, no, remember this. I have the parole. Um, detainer from my parole violation. So I get that served concurrent with all this stuff. And so now I'm six months in on a 30 month sentence and I get moved. The, the whole maneuver that we do gets me moved to the minimum six months in with two years left. There is nobody else at this minimum security with that much time left in their sentence. So the second I go there, I'm under fucking question. You know what I mean? And even the staff there is like, how the fuck did this kid get here with two years left in his sentence? So they were they were fucking with me. You know what I mean? They were like, we're going to get rid of you. Like the superintendent there specifically was just a motherfucker and didn't like that the guys at the other facility made this power move for me, you know? Right. And so so I'm there. I got my friends there. And you know what I mean? It, we, everything's good. And they're like, you're not going on work release for at least a year and a half. So you're just going to sit here in the building. I'm like, all right, whatever. Even sitting in that building is way better. There's still tons of movement. The food's great, whatever. And I'm wearing fucking like, you know, gray sweats and like, you know, my some of my own clothes. You can't wear like logos, but like you can have like your own sweats dropped off and stuff like that. So I'm wearing my own clothes and it's just a little bit more freedom. Mm -hmm. And people going to work release and bringing back cell phones to use and fucking food and snacks, cigarettes. 
So I'm like there for a couple of weeks and I'm just like, whatever, this is better. It's summertime and I go out in the yard, it's fucking sun shining on me. And then of course they're just consistently trying to like fuck with me. And I was in a room, I wasn't even smoking, but like the people in the room I was in were smoking cigarettes. And so they're like, everybody, you're all, you know, fucking get a D ticket or whatever. You know what I mean? Which typically can be like trash duty for a week. You know what I mean? Some sort of like bitch work or whatever. But they can give you really whatever they want. And so when the superintendent there found out that I was in the room, he was like, we're sending him back. And so when you go back for a a D-board violation from the minimum, they put you in the hole for 30 days. So I know that now I'm going back to the fucking max in July. It's like fucking 90 degrees with no AC in a box for 30 days of torture. And so I'm like, fuck this. I'm taking off. Because the superintendent wasn't in that day, and I was there when he was on speakerphone with the uh, D-board officer, and he was like, he was like, keep Hickey there. I want to drive him back, my, drive him back to Middleton myself. And I'm like, this dude just hates me for no reason, you know? Right. So he didn't like that I was able to like, you know, get favors or whatever. He just, you know, maybe he didn't like the person that did the favor for me. Who fucking knows? And so I go to a kid that is from that town that we're in. He's in the facility and he goes to work release and he has a phone. And I'm like, yeah, I need to use your phone. Make some phone calls. I'm like, listen, you got boys around here. Cause these boys would always come by and like drop packages, kinds of cigarettes and shit on the highway. And they go out and stick on the farm and grab, bring them in. And I'm like, I need to ride out of here tonight. He's like, wait, what? And I'm like, yeah, dude, they bring me back to Middleton. I'm like, fuck this dude. I'm taking off, dude. It's like, dude, they catch you in like 24 hours. They have a 24 hour recovery rate. They're the best recovery rate in the state. And I'm like, Fucking catch me if you, again, catch me if you can, motherfuckers. And so he had his friend. I said, listen, tell him. I'm like, tell him I'll get him. I'll get him some money. I'll get him some drugs. I'll, I'll give him some stuff and get me the ride. And he's like, all right. So there's this, um, like, door you got to get out at night if you're doing, like, trash duty, where it's like you go into a, a, a room, that door locks behind you. There's a glass window here with a cop in it, and then, the, and then there's a, the main door here. And so I come in with an officer because I go down and tell the kitchen guys, I'm like, hey, I have to do trash duty tonight. I got caught smoking cigarettes, you know, and they don't know that there's this whole other plan going. And I know that I know that they're like, these CEOs are segregated from what's going on in administration. They have no fucking clue. They're just like, all right, yeah, Hickey, yeah, you gotta do trash. Come on, grab all the fucking trash. So I get just it's pouring out. And my thing is like, there's a little fence I got to jump once I get into the parking lot where the dumpster is. And to do that, I'm going to have to knock this fucking cop out to get up and get over this fence. And it's a jump over the fence too, because I got to go over like a little bit of bob wire, but it's raining. So it's all mud because it's on a river. It's on the side of this place called the Merrimack river. And so we go out, we go through the mic and I'm like, you know, fucking like stressing like the whole time, like, fuck, 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 is this going to work? Like just getting through the rooms, you know what I mean? And they buzz me right. out and I'm like, wait for that cop to be like, wait, no, hey, he's not doing trash. He's not going to go back. And he's like, all right, yeah, boom, boom, boom. I'm just like, keep my head down. And I get out, and it's pouring out, and I'm with the CEO, and I'm walking out to the parking lot with the thing, and then staff pops over on like, the other side of the building, and he's getting wet, and he's like, hey, listen, he's like, Hickey, he's like, just fucking throw that in the dumpster and get right back in, okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm like, what do you want me to hang out in this? And I'm like, oh, shit, I don't have to fucking blast this guy. And so he takes off to his car. I go over like I'm going to the dumpster, drop the bag, climb up the dumpster, like scale this telephone pole, and then just like push myself off the pole over the fence, into the mud. I'm like up to my knee, up to above my knees in mud, like just like like quicksand, like stuck in mud. And I pull myself out of it and I'm running through the farm, covered in mud, raining. And the kid's friend is up underneath the billboard waiting for me as promised, you know, because he thinks he's getting money and drugs for doing this. So I end up hijacking him, taking his car, going to my friend's house. And then I'm hiding in the, and then I'm hiding in the rave scene for like, Six days. And again, remember, they have a 24-hour recovery rate. And so now I last six days. And the way they caught me was um, I had I had um, cell phones, burner phones. And they had HAs literally beating up my friends in this neighborhood that I was connected to for the sheriff's department to find out where I was and find out this phone number because the sheriff's department had to – go to other measures to try to find me because their own 40 man apprehension team couldn't find me. So they had to say, Hey, look, help us find this guy. And when you guys get in trouble and come here, we'll take care of you and make sure you go to the minimum. And blah, 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 blah. So right. they got one of the burn phones that I was using and they pinged it to where I was in Vermont. I was up in Montpelier, Vermont. 
and um, I was on my way to California. I don't know what I like. I, I had no like real structure of like how I was going to do this forever, but I was like slowly figuring it out like I always do. And uh, like six in the morning, I'm in this apartment with these two girls, and I hear all this like banging and crashing and loud noises. And they're in the, and all of a sudden, the, there's the task force in the room with me. And I'm like, fuck. So then I get held up in like Billy Goatville in the mountains of Vermont, <laughs> like at a jail up there, which was still better than what I was going back to. But I was there for a few days, and then I just waived extradition, came back to uh, Middleton. And they would put me in the hole and my lawyer, the guy will got involved and said, listen, if you're going to punish him in, 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 you know, in the facility before he has a trial, he's like, I'm going to pull up a double jeopardy clause because if you're going to put him in segregation for 30 days, 90 days, whatever, they were talking like 90 days. He's like, then I'm going to utilize that as a double jeopardy punishment for, for court, you know? And they were like, right. so they let me out of the hole. So they let me out of the hole and then I go to court for the escape. And they lost all the records somehow. They lost all the reports and nothing. Everything was gone. Everything just kind of like fucking disappeared. Nice. You don't know how. Whatever. So the judge dismisses it without prejudice, though. And, of course, they redo the reports, find them, whatever the fuck they do. And six months later, while I'm still doing my sentence, I get charged again. But because all of their, like, fuck ups, the judge was like, listen, we're just going to offer my lawyers. Like, how about this? How about we give them? What was he doing? How much time was he doing before he escaped? And he's six months. He's like, all right, we're going to give him the six months back. So that's six months that you did before you escaped is null and void. You have to do that now on the back end. So I did 30, ended up serving 30 months straight. But that's like not a bad fucking deal. All things no, like said. No, for an escape. They could double, they could have doubled my time, hit me with five years. There's like so many other way worse options that could have happened. And so that kind of, you know, launched the big story of like, Johnny Hickey, everybody knew because everybody now was in like everybody in the jail was ripped into a room and interrogated. Like, where is he? He escaped. You know, they were they were raiding people's houses. Anyone I wrote a letter to. So it was just like viral before things were viral. It's like MySpace days. You know what I mean? Yeah, I was going to say the 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 street cred you got for that was probably huge among your peers. Mm -hmm. And I was already known for like the other crazy shit. The scores and shit I was doing. So my peers were just like, oh, Hickey's a fucking nut. Like, he just, you know, he's not. I can't believe he escaped. And then he, you know. So then I, so I do that. I do that bit. And when I get out of that sentence, now I'm on five years drug court. Um, so I got two and a half in there. So I got two and a half left of drug court where you have to go. At this time, every Wednesday, you go to the court. You have to take a urine before court. You know, if you're clean, you're good. You, and you go back out and, and have to show that you do your meetings and all the bullshit. I was paying. I was supposed to be in a sober house. I knew the guy that was running the sober house. So I was paying him to say that I was in this. I had a room in the sober house, but I was never. I didn't live there. But to right. everybody else, I was, you know, the courts, everything. I was there. So I had the sober house thing going. I was, you know, I was doing uh, clean urines overall. But I was eating pills and doing like some fucked up shit sometimes. So I would get those drinks, and who knows what those things did to my fucking body back then. I get these like those purple drinks that like flush your body out, right? So you can't detect drugs, and so I was doing those things, and I was passing my urine. So I was doing good in drug court, and then I just kind of got caught back up in everything. Obviously, I went right back into the you know rob and scheme and doing things, and uh, we were in a stolen car, me and my friends. We stole like a Dodge Neon. And it had no reverse in it. And we were in, we we're down the South Shore of Mass. And we're down the South Shore of Mass and, um, in Quincy. And I'm in there buying cigarettes. And like at the time I was smoking cigarettes and candy, whatever the fuck I was doing. And I see my buddy, Mikey, arguing with another kid outside the store. Like, you know what I mean? Something's going on. So I'm like, all right, give me my stuff. And I get out there and they're, now they're fist fighting. They're fist fighting and they're up against the, the door that's open with the stolen cars that we're in. And I see his friend, the kid that's fighting my friend, friend like creeping in on, on my boy. And he doesn't know that I'm there. So I kind of come up around him and I sock at him, hit him in the jaw like a good fucking like haymaker, soccer punch him. He hits the ground. I look in at my friend Mikey's who's like now bat on his back in the back of the stolen car. And the other kid's on top of him. And I'm like running over to help him now with this kid. 
and Mikey, all of a sudden I just see them like go from like this to like Mikey's now moving this way and this kid's falling out of the car screaming and Mikey breaking a Heineken bottle over his face, stabbing him in the face repeatedly. The kid looked like fucking Freddy Krueger. And we're like pushing, now we're pushing, he's got blood all over his hands. We're pushing this hot box in reverse out of the parking lot because it has no reverse in it to get away. And so we get away and, you know, and then that's the thing. And so we're out of that. The cops don't get involved. You know what I mean? Those other kids were like street kids. So they didn't say nothing. And the next night there was a big party in the same neighborhood at a hotel. And I was hooking up with this girl down there. Make a long story short on this. Like we went to this hotel party and it just turned into chaos. And they knew we were the kids that, you know, had beef with these other kids. So someone made a phone call. And before you knew it, they were like, you know, 10 car loads of kids in the parking lot waiting for us. And the way the fight broke up in the hotel and we like security came up and we were like all like kind of like making our way down stairwells and shit to like get out of there because the cops were coming. And I when it got out into the parking lot, my buddy Mikey was a fucking mental case. Like he was just so fearless. There's literally like 13 kids like with fucking weapons and shit ready to rock and roll. And he just runs right into them like, what's up, motherfuckers, you know? And then all of a sudden he's on the ground, his shirt's over his head. It went from a white t-shirt to, a, to the color red y'all wearing and just covered in blood. And it was, you know, I was still in that kind of like street, you know, mentality back then where it's like, can't leave my boy. I'll never live that down. I won't be solid. You know what I mean? Knowing that I'm going to get my ass kicked. Like, there's no way, like, we're going to, like, just run through 13 kids. But I had a I had a knife on me. I had this Gerber knife on me. I'll never forget it. I was like, I'm just going to start stabbing kids. Like, not to kill them, but, like, I'm going to go up and stab this kid in the ass, stab this kid in the arm. Like, I'm going to fucking stop poking people. Because they're gonna when you stop poking people, they get the whole yeah, that, yeah. demeanor changes. You know, the whole demeanor changes when you're poking somebody. So... I'm like, I'm going to, and when I tell you this, like, I think I'm crazy or whatever. I snapped the Gerber knife out, ready to do all that. And it literally just like fucking disappeared out of my hands. Like it was just gone. Like, I don't know where it went. I don't know if it flew up in the sky. I don't know if I dropped it. And I'm looking on the ground and I got it. I just don't know. And I, you know what I mean? I was always flicking it out. So it wasn't like I flicked it and it, and it was just like, it was a light, nice Gerber knife, you know, with a hollow handle. And I flicked it out and it was just gone. Right. So there's that. So who knows what, what happened? Maybe I dropped and didn't see it. Maybe something above and beyond what I understand happened. I don't know, because maybe I would have done something that night that I would have regretted for the, forever. And I want to be able to be on this podcast talking to you right now. Right. So nice gone. And so now I'm like in the middle of this like fight with it, you know, bashing my boy's face in the ground, stomping him. And I'm just like, who's like the who's the lead ringleader of this group? Who's like the one that they're all? And I see like this kid, he's a big kid, jacked. You know what I mean? It looks like he just did time. Fucking came home, with, you know. And I'm just like, I'm up on him too, sucking him. And he like did the like one leg where like I'm like, oh, he's not going down. But then he went down. And for probably like I don't know three seconds, like I put my hands up and was like, what's up? What's up? Like put your fucking hands up to like the rest of the group. And it paused for a minute where my boy was like getting off the ground. And I'm like, oh, these kids are fucking scared now because I because I because I got their boy. And then boom, in the back of my head, like they hit me with a rock or something. And I woke up seven days later in Boston Medical Center. They threw me off an 80 foot cliff, dislocated my hip, separated my pelvis. My bladder exploded, tore my urethra and I uh, was in a coma for seven days, was told I would never walk again, was told I would never be able to use the waist down and have kids. God, whatever you believe in, call it what you will. I don't force my things on anybody else. Or I'm not like that kind of guy. I keep, you know, my spirituality is like mine, you know, because I just have right. a different way of things. Um, but, you know, through prayer and manifestation of my own, you know, like refusing to accept that. In my mind, I was like, I know how to walk again. And I was so mad at myself for putting myself in this situation now where I'm being told by, you know, doctors that I'm not never going to walk again, never going to have a kid, never be able to use my dick. And I was in that hospital for 30 days and I had, I was on morphine on the six minute drip button. So like every time, uh, you know, I felt pain or whatever, I hit the button, morphine would go into my, now remember I did oxys, didn't like them. So my pills right. of choice, were benzos, right? My pills of choice were benzos. And so I, I never wanted to be a heroin addict, right? And, and I frowned upon heroin because my sister OD'd on heroin. And when she OD'd on heroin, it was when heroin was actually like 
had this like little mini comeback, of, like right when Oxy was coming out. And at that time, I hadn't put two and two together that, which nobody had really, that oxycontin was heroin in a pill form. It was the same fucking thing, right? So overall, right? So it was like thirteen perks in one pill, and so I always frowned upon becoming a heroin. Like I hated heroin, and I was so mad at myself for my involvement in the oxycontin world because. If I knew it was heroin, I don't think I ever would have gone. I really, truly, the, my morals for, like, my sister Odean and stuff and her, I never would have wanted to do that. And and so I'm on the morphine, which I know is also heroin, basically. You know what I mean? Another opiate fucking painkiller. And when I would do the six-minute button, it wasn't that it killed my pain, like my bones and all the shit that was broken. It made me fucking not care that I was never going to walk again. For those brief moments that it brought me to that level, and they were brief. They didn't last forever. Again, it's a six-minute button, right? So I'd have these moments where, like, I just didn't give a fuck about anything. and Yeah, it's, it's all going to be okay. Right? This is fine. And then, come, and then I'd come out of the morphine, right? And I'd be like, like what the fuck? I'm like, I'm never going to be able to fucking use my dick. Like, I'm never going to be able to walk. Like... And, and then it started giving me nightmares. I started doing the morphine, and I'd come when I would come off of it and sleep at night, I'd have like fucking these demonic nurses coming in my room and trying to like do evil things. I was I was on another fucking level of like dream sequence. So I ripped the morphine out of my arm and I'm like, I don't want this no more. And they were like, well, let's try Demerol, Delauda, this, that, the other thing. I, I don't want fucking nothing. I'm going cold turkey. So I went cold turkey in Boston Medical Center. Doc, this is documented too. I can get you to, you know what I mean? I tell people this and I swear people don't believe me, but I had uh, Mike Nerney was the doctor and he wrote a letter my drug court. Remember, I'm still in drug court at the time too. And I'm like, nah, I got thrown off a cliff. And so he wrote a letter saying that if anybody, you know, deserved to be on painkillers and morphine and opiates and stuff for their injuries, it was this man right here. And he has refused all narcotics during his 30 day stay here at BMC. Um, and I truly think that me doing that in my manifestation with God inside of me and everything, and just like where my head was at, um, I was able to get everything back. I taught myself how to walk again to the point where like, because my pelvic bone separated, they couldn't, sometimes they, if you pel if you break your pelvis, depending on how you break it, they can put a, go in and cut you open and put a wire in, kind of wire it back together and hold it in place. Right. And they couldn't do that with me because my bladder exploded. All these other infections I had going on, my white blood cell count would notice that as an infection. And then the other infections could kill me, the other bacteria that were going on. So it was too high risk to do that. So they said my pelvis would heal like this, like widened, like how it separated. And my best option would probably be that I could walk on, you know, stilts or a walker. You know, that would be my that would probably be the best I could get to outside of a wheelchair. And then carrying around a piss bag forever too, because I tore my urethra and there's no way to fix that, right? So I would go home on my walker and I would like teach myself how to walk again and like walk on my good leg and just slowly bring in my bad leg, slowly bring in my bad leg. And then before you knew it, I was on crutches, a cane, and I'm going to BMC and they're like, can we give you, and they couldn't explain how my pelvis went back on its own. And that same doctor, that Mike Nerdy doctor, the main doctor, there's a bunch of different, like I had a urologist that had all these different doctors, but the main um, physician there, he said, well, you know, muscle has memory. He's like, so why can't bone? He's like, you know what I mean? He's like, that's the explanation. He's like, you're, your mind, your brain, your body your, it just decided to make your pelvis go back to where it was. We can't explain medically how that happened, but your pelvis is back in the same position it was in before you fell 80 feet. So I was like, oh. So then I got really like heavy spirits. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, this is like real. Like, oh, this is a miracle, right? right? And then I had to go in for a urology test because my catheters would get backed up. They got like crystallized and they have to take them. I was like, the worst pain ever, like taking this tube mm -hmm. out of your fucking dick. And you know what I mean? And so... I go in and they make me drink this like milky shit. They put me in a machine to like see how it is and stuff. And then we, I come out. This is four months later now. And the doctor taps me on the shoulder and he looks at me and he goes, have a good night. And like smiling. And I'm like, what do you, like, what? Like, what do you mean have a good night? And he's like, like, have a good night. Like your shit works again. He's like, your, he's like, your urethra healed around the catheter. He's like, and that's why it keeps getting backed up because it, your body wants to not have this in you no more. He's like, so. Right. Like, you're all good. 
And I'm like, wait, what? I'm all good? Like, like I wasn't expecting that. The fact that I could walk again was I was grateful enough for, and I was like willing to live with, you know, the catheter thing. I just didn't think it was going to heal. Like, cause it just doesn't typically. And, and it healed. And now, like I was telling you earlier, I got full custody of my four year old, full custody of my teenage daughter, you know? So, um, so I have two beautiful how, girls you now. How long ago was this? So this was, um, 2005, this happens. Okay. And so then after, um, after the accident happened and I manifest, I was in walking, I ended up going to drug court with that letter from, um, the doctor and they read that and they read it out loud in the court to all the people who were like getting high and relapsing and he was like, right. what was your excuse to relapse? What was your excuse to relapse? Cause you're going away for 30 days. You're being held for 10 days, whatever. And they're like, Mr. Hickey fell 80 feet, dislocated his hip, separated his pelvis, blah, 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 blah. And refused all narcotics for 30 days. He's like, that says something. He's like that willpower and that commitment says something. He's like, so you know what, Mr. Hickey, I think you're all set. I don't think you're going to be on drug court for the next two years. I think, I think this is a wrap and I think you should, I think you should go and, and live a new life. And I was like, wait, what? And they cut my drug court. So now is my probation cut. So now I'm like a free man too. So all these like miracles happen at once. And I said, well, what do I do now? And I was like, you know what? I'm going to live my childhood fucking dream. I'm going to take all this negative shit that I went through all this crazy chapter of my life, especially the Oxycontin stuff, because it's such a big topic and it's affecting so many people and nobody's doing anything documentary wise yet, film wise, nobody's doing anything on this. I'm going to make a movie about this chapter of my life. And so I decided to get involved in, in how do I write a screenplay? And I'm sitting there writing in a notebook, chicken scratch. You have I don't no, know. And you have no idea how any of this works. No, I'm just gonna you're gonna wing it. I'm gonna fucking wing it. And I'm like, all right, but here's my biggest thing is like it, when I was a street kid and I was running crews and going to raves and doing all these things, I was a networker. I always knew how to get to the next level of people that I needed to be involved with to be that much higher up on the totem pole. So how do I get not only write the screenplay, but how do I get connected to Hollywood? Right? Right. And I remember when I was a kid, my cousin, my older cousin worked as a door guy at the comedy connection in Faneuil Hall in Boston. It's an iconic comedy club, right? And he had this cork board with like Polaroid pictures back in the eighties when I was a little kid. And I remember it was like Jim Carrey, Jamie Foxx. And he was friends with a lot of these guys. Like he had like, you know, he'd talk to a lot of these guys. And, then, and when they would come to Boston, they would hang out with him, go for drinks, that kind of stuff. And so he was friends with all these like comedians and eventually some of them became like huge A list celebrities. So I'm like, man, what if I could get a job at the Comedy Connection and network with comedians? Like, just take the same social networking skills I have and apply it in there and just become, you know, become like a, you know, a, a door guy, make it $12 an hour at the time. And I, and I get the job through my cousin makes a call. Hey, you know, my cousin, he's doing good. He wants to get his life around. He's, so they did it. And I was going to Bunker Hill Community College at the time for media technology, you know, to try to learn film and stuff. Um while I'm doing the college stuff and working at the club, I end up talking to like two of my professors and they're like, Johnny, like, honestly, you should just not waste your time. Like literally said, there's not waste your time here and just go for it. Like go for it. Cause they heard all my ideas and like what I want to do. They're like, this is going to slow you down. You have a, you know, you, you have a mission Like you like, go. My sociology professor was like, go, go do this plan that you have. Like, cause I talk to them about like the comedy connection and stuff. And so I worked full time at the comedy connection every night of the week meeting with comedians like Jim Brewer, who just asked me to be on his podcast a few days ago. So I was talking to Jim Brewer on there. Bill Burr is a friend of mine now who's always been super supportive of um, all my films and tweets about them and talks about me on his podcast and stuff. But at the beginning stage, um, I brought my notebook of like a synopsis, I guess you could call it maybe my story, 20 pages of like my idea, you know, and, chicken scratch to this comedian Lenny Clark and I got an audition for a short film that he was in with this guy John Fiore who was on the Sopranos he played Gigi he was the mob boss on season one two and three dies on the toilet right and so, so 
yeah, so Gigi was in it. So I'm, now I'm in a room in a short film, but a decent little role with this guy, Lenny Clock, who's Dennis Leary's best friend. He's in Rescue Me. He's he's iconic Boston comedian, like huge. Um, and he's an actor. He's in a bunch of movies and stuff. And then John Fiore from The Sopranos. And so I'm talking to both of them about my idea. They love it. And then I show it to Lenny, and Lenny's like, reads it and he's like hey let me see what i can do so lenny took it and because he was friends with dennis leary brought it to this writer at apostle pictures who wrote for rescue me and that guy doug he taught me how to properly write a screenplay format it like what you had to do how exterior is you know outside of building interiors inside of all that stuff where the dialogue goes and he hooked me up with uh final draft at the time hooked me up with a bigger final draft to teach me how to you know format write a screenplay and so then i wrote oxymorons and did you know multiple rewrites on it and got it into a an official screenplay that now by that time working in the comedy club and writing this movie i had become friends with this guy frank santarelli um who was also in the sopranos he played uh georgie at the bada bing at the the bartender the bada bing yeah yeah yeah. and so he's like oh let me see what I so everybody loved oxymorons as a screenplay and so that led me to getting James Gandolfini flying here after reading the screenplay to Boston, having a poo-poo platter with me at this place called the Kowloon that's this, like, infamous Chinese restaurant here. And James Gandolfini wants to option oxymorons from me. So he wants to give me 50 grand, which at the time to me was a lot of fucking money, 15 points on the back end, but it becomes his property now. He wants to take it, make it about kids in New York, not Boston. I'll have nothing to do with the acting, directing, or anything like that. I'll own 15 points in the back end, which equals nothing, you know, on the back end, you know, right. in the net. You know, not in the gross, in the net. Um, I'll have 50 grand, and I'll get a story by credit. And I looked at him, and I go, you know, this is my life story. This is a chapter of my life. This is something I'm, I'm like honored to be sitting here with you, like eating with you and that you're even interested in, in my thing. But like, I believe in fate and destiny and I need to be a part of this. Like I can't just sell out. I have to be a part of this. And he laughed and he was like, good luck with fate and destiny. And I was like, fuck like blown away. Like this close away from being like, fuck you. How's that? You fucking punk. Like, cause that's, you know what I mean? I don't give right. a fuck. And I was like, but I was with other guys that introduced me to him that I did respect. So I composed myself. We took him to the airport. And when we took him to the airport, you know, God rest his soul, he died not long after this. But we took him to the airport. He stopped before he went into the gates, turned around, came back to me. And he's like, hey, I've, something's just been bothering me for the last few minutes. He's like, when you said the fate and destiny thing, and I, and I kind of clowned on that. He's like, I take that back. He's like, you should believe in fate and destiny. And he's like, and you should fucking go for it and you'll do it. And then James Gandolfini got on an airplane. I never seen him again. But that created a news frenzy of like James Gandolfini was in town to buy this movie, you know, to be, produce this movie, Oxymorons, about Johnny Hickey, the pharmacy rob, the bandit, da 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 da. So I had every major radio station, everybody calling me the next day. I'm living at my mother's still, and I'm getting right. limos coming to pick me up to bring me to like Maddie in the Morning, which is like the number one radio show in Boston top three in the in the global market at the time huge and everybody wants to know why james gandolfini was here and you know is he buying my movie and i told him the story i just told you now like you know like well i'm gonna do this we're gonna the comedy club here's my story here's why it's important to me and i don't want to sell out and it would just so i was able to then go to people in the north end of boston the italian neighborhood where like they were like, why is Gandolfini want this? Because, like, Gandolfini and them was like a god. You know, they would pay, right. these restaurant owners would pay, like, other guys from the Sopranos that weren't him to come in, do an appearance at their restaurants. So they all wanted in. So I got 10 grand here, 50 grand here. So I started raising my own funding to do, to do oxymorons. And then I would come up with these ideas in my head of, like, things I wanted to do that – you know, in some people's minds it would be impossible, but I was like, I want to get a UFC fighter to play this role. It's so like I'm talking to Forrest Griffin now at the time, who's like at the time one of the top UFC fighters. Right. And then he wins the belt against Rampage 
and now his management wants too much money. And I go from talking to Forrest on my own on the phone every fucking day in emails and Facebook or whatever to now I got to deal with his management who wants 30 grand a week that I don't have to give him to be in it. And then Tim Sylvia reaches out to me, who's the five time fucking champion, who's originally from Bangor, Maine. So he's from New England, had a football injury, he was going to be a football, you know, pro football he was going for, got injured playing football, ended up hooked on oxys. Fucked up his football career, but then went on to become the, the fucking heavyweight champion of the UFC. And he and I'm like, well, all right, well, maybe this is meant to be for him. And so then Tim read for the pot, killed it. So he's in Oxymorons, Tim Sylvia, plays my cousin in it. So I got Tim Sylvia. I got this camera. The red camera at the time was a big fucking deal. It is still to this day. It's the yeah, best. Yeah. You, know, you know, you got you got your red, your Aries, and your black magic, but like. But red, this was the red one. No other red existed yet at this time. It was the red one. So I end up finding a Chilean DP who actually knows how to, owns a red, knows how to use it. He shoots for National, never shot a movie before, but he shoots stuff for National Geographic and like Chilean shit, like animals attacking each other, mountain lions, fucking whatever, on red. And so I bring it to him and he's like, I would love to do this, Johnny. He's like, how do you want me to shoot this though? I like, I literally want you to shoot this movie. Like you're shooting fucking animals in the jungle. Like these scenes that are going to happen, we're not going to get to do them two times, three times. Cause we know that kind of budget. Right. We got to capture this shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's animals fighting in the jungle. And he's like, I'm all in. So I end up getting this heavy duty camera with a professional fucking high end DP with the lenses and everything we need. And then everything else starts coming in and falling into place for me. The city of Boston waves all my permits. Wherever you want to shoot, just let us know. We'll get you detailed cops. Bunker Hill Projects nice. were up. Reach out to the head of housing. Yeah, go ahead. Shoot in the hallways. Shoot in the rooftops. And then they had shut down. Remember I told you about my church earlier? Um, my Catholic church with, where they would send us for the bologna sandwiches. Right. That, that was like my Catholic, there was a Catholic school there too, and they had shut all that down because the Catholic churches obviously had gotten all the trouble and stuff. And so the church was empty, and I had a church scene, and then the whole school was empty. So they gave me the whole because I was a, they knew me and I was an altar boy. They gave me the entire school to use as my headquarters, and I also turned into a police station. The rectory, which I turned into my mother's project apartment, and all this property is in the middle of the housing project. So it's like housing projects surround and encompass this property. So it's like being in the projects that yeah. we need to shoot the film in. Well, and a then, perfect location, really, right? Yeah, absolutely. And they give me the church. And then I remembered when I was doing time, you could put in for transfers. And again, my camp was like hell. So there were a few camps that were like decent camps, like Bill Ricca, 12 and a half days a month, good time, yard time, Bonstable, 12 and a half days a month, good time. So you wanted to go to one of those camps because your good time was 12 and a, if you was, you know, doing a program or work or whatever, it was 12 and a half days a month knocked off your sentence. It's close to half, you know, half your sentence, about 40% of your sentence knocked off. So it's, those are good camps and good, easy living. So I knew that Bonstable stopped doing transfers during my last bid because what happened was they had they were overrun with inmates and had people sleeping in tents outside of the uh, the, the county jail in the yards, which is like super illegal, super like inappropriate. And so they applied for a federal grant to build a new prison, and they blamed the amount of inmate overflow on the opiate epidemic that was going on, the opiate-related death, crimes, you know, drug use, all that stuff, because no one had ever seen that before. And, and it was true. So that was down the down Cape, which still to this day has been so hit hard by the opiate epidemic. So I knew that they got a new jail and I knew that the old jail was sitting there now as like a community center for like one part of it. But like the whole rest of the jail was just vacant. And I was like, well, listen, they got a federal grant because of opiate. So I'm going to go to them with my journalist friend who's writing a story about me. And so I went in, met with the commissioner down there. And one of the superintendents and said, you know, hey, this is my friend Chris. He's doing the story about me in the Phoenix. So right, right away, like, let them know that, like, we're doing a story. And, you know, I wrote a movie about, you know, the collateral damage of OxyContin. One is done to communities, my life, who I've lost. And, I'm, you know, I'm trying to turn my life around and live my dream as a filmmaker. And I want to use the jail for the jail scenes. And I know it's empty. I don't know if there's something we can do here. And they just like, you know, was like, let us get back to you tomorrow. And they knew I had the journey. And the next day, they were like, "Hey, Johnny, we're gonna uh, we're gonna give you the jail for two weeks. You can have it for two weeks. It's yours. Come get the keys." 
I will go and I literally have the master keys, like this fucking metal ring with a giant. I'm an ex-con, you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. now I'm walking around master keys to a county jail, even though it's empty, but it's still. And when I went, remember I went in and I was started pissing in one of the metal toilets that have the, you know, they have the sink connected to them that yeah. you gotta like you fucking make your soups out of with your shit. And yeah. I'm pissing in that toilet, and I remember the surrealness of like. I thought I dreamt about this. I dreamt about making a movie, but I never even like dreamt about like how I'm in a jail now where I used to be like, this used to be the worst place for me. And now it's, I'm living my dream here, making a movie. Yeah. This, and then, this oh, can't be happening. This, this yeah, and so, nothing falls into place like this. Nothing falls into place. So then um, I get a, a cop involved and give him a role as like one of the other cops, you know, and he's a homicide detective in Boston. And so he starts making calls to all his buddies. And so now, before I know it, I got a helicopter from the state police for a helicopter scene that flies over. I got correctional officers from another county coming down to do the move team scenes and play correctional officers in the jail scenes at the empty jail that I'm in. So I literally had the whole move team from another county come down and do a move team scene in the movie with the, to attack Tim Sylvia and gas him. Right. Um, that were re- every so everybody in this movie turns out to be real street kids playing street kids, real cops playing cops, real Boston cop cars, real Boston police. Real, there's a scene where they raid us and they come in in their gear, and it's the it's the uh, DEA task force, not like the federal DEA, like it's like the Boston police DEA task force that yeah. works with them, and they come in full gear, black helmets, vests. Real fucking assault rifles. Their assault rifles. I don't know if they're loaded. It's like so illegal. Like even them doing this favor, with them do, and they boot the, the door off the hinges for us, and they come in. And they we got these real guns pointed to our head, and everybody that I know that works in law enforcement watches that scene and like, yo, those well, those real guys. Like, who trained them? Like those are real guys, you know. And so the whole community, because of what it was about, came together for me. You know, we just had everything: extras and jails and cop cars and just the run of the city to, to make this film. Um, and so I did it. I made a movie and then I had to go into the, the next steps of like, yeah, what I was going to say it? that's only one part oh, of only one part. the process. And yeah, the next part is equally as, as, um, uh, as important is actually getting it out there and getting the media attention and getting it into, uh, um, uh, theaters and and uh, festivals and like that's that's another whole group of impossible uh, impossibilities that you have to attack with no experience right so i so the so there's this just to not jump out of it but like d- during this moment right here where we're at we're like now i'm done filming and the executive producer who also plays a role in the movie he plays the dirty cop this guy uh, who owned these restaurants in the North End was one of the big investors. Um, he's sitting with me in his restaurant. We're eating food. Like, we're always, he always have us over for food and, you know, stuff like that, D- you know, during production, after production. And me and him have a conversation like me and you are right now, but face-to-face, right? And I'm doing just how I talk like this with my hands and how I, how, I, how I discuss, you know, dialogue. And he's like, man, he's like, you remind me so much of my friend Victor. And I go, huh. And I go, that's funny. My dad's name was Victor, but I don't know him. I just know that his name was Victor. He had a brother, Jerry. They made pizza at Francesco's in 1987. And that's all I know about them, you know? And he goes, ah, to me. And he remembers the story because it was a one-night stand with my mother. My dad, who was 17 at the time. My mother was 21. Um, Charlestown, Irish neighborhood girl, North End Italian guy. You know, that time was like frowned upon certain things. You know what I mean? So he disappeared, he, but he ends up getting deported. He ends up getting, getting in trouble and getting deported uh, back to Naples, Italy, and then gets in trouble in Italy and ends up in London throughout my life. You know what I mean? My childhood and stuff. Right. But from oxymorons, my film, after I finished it, sitting with my executive producer eating in a restaurant, I find my dad. I find my dad who I've never known, never met, but all my other family members, my grandmother, my grand, all live in the neighborhood right where I'm sitting. And that night I go and meet everybody and they all look at me and I, so I grew up in an Irish neighborhood. My mother's blonde hair, blue eyed. My brother's blonde hair, blue eyed. Everybody's blonde hair, blue eyed. 
but me. I'm Doc here, Doc Eyed. And I look, Greco's the Italian side of my family. I look just like, I mean, there's no, I didn't even need a DNA test. It's that scary. Right. Me and my dad are like, and he's like, and that executive producer guy was like, I can't believe this. This is like fucking weird, right? So my dad can't come to the United States, even though everybody else can come here now. My dad can't come to the United States. And I'm talking to him on Facebook and stuff, which is like super fucking cool. You know what I mean? Like, I like found my dad. And I'm doing this whole thing with the, you know, getting the movie out to where it needs to be. So we end up uh, getting an editor in South Boston, this guy Paul Buell, to edit it for me. And we get a two and a half hour cut of the movie that we end up going to Los Angeles with. And I end up finding a big post house in L.A. that, again, fall into place. Like, they just love what I'm doing. And they donate like a $200,000 post package to the film with nothing in return, just to help believing in what, who I am, what I'm doing and what I'm trying to do. At the same time, I get a phone call from this woman who's like Portuguese. And she's like, Hey, I'm looking for Johnny Hickey. And I'm like, yeah, she's like, my name is Mariana Vanzella. I'm with current TV. Current TV was Al Gore's channel. And Keith Oldman's channel was a, like a national geographic channel for a while on cable, current TV, very heavy documentary style stuff. And, and she was in Boston doing a story on the uh, Oxycontin crimes because that's where the biggest amount of like robberies and stuff were taking place. And she had just won the PBD award for the original Oxycontin Express about the pill mills in Florida and the doctors with the scripts. So she went from there and she was traveling from like, here's what's going on in Florida, but now here's what's going on in Boston, how they're getting them in Boston. It's two different, two different ways, right? Because people from Boston were going down there now to get their pills in Florida because all the pharmacy robberies were getting too tight and everyone was kind of dying down in Boston. And she's like, your name keeps popping up everywhere. She's like, I'd love to interview you. So I go and I meet with her and her husband, Darren Foster, who's, he just won Sundance, a huge documentary. And now she's on National Geographic, has her own show. And she's Darren doing Foster this thing wrote, called The Oxycontin. Wrote, Darren Foster wrote what? Um, uh, uh, Science Fair. Uh, American Pain? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The book American mm-hmm. Pain, which is what was... Yep, yep, that's him. So the guy... So Derek, that's him and his wife's Mariana Van Zell. The guy Derek Nolan, who's in the Oxy Express. I don't know him. Yeah, he's the... So he was yes. the manager. He was the manager of the uh, American Pain clinics. Um, really? Yeah, so I actually wrote a story called Pain... I was in prison with him, and I wrote a story about Derek. It um, it's called Pain. So, wow! Uh, yeah, Small it's, world. That's, right? That's nuts. So, but anyway, you were saying. So, but so they so they come to Boston, and then they meet me, and they love me. Like we just connect, and they ask me to become a f- field producer on their production and help bring them into the underbelly of like people that now it was perk 30s so i was explaining to them i'm like listen oxy's not even relevant no more now every now this perk 30s blue percocet pills are 30 milligrams i'm like and now that's what's kind of taking over so i introduced them to everything that was going on and i brought them to the methadone clinics and like every every little thing and then as they're doing that they're telling my story in this documentary of like what i was doing the pharmacies and my falling off the cl- and all and all the stuff and so part two of, of the Oxycontin Express, they um, was all basically about me and then the places that I brought them to. So now I have this like major documentary team for a major like, you know, the time was like a National Geographic on TV doing a story on me. Then Channel 5 News locally is doing a story on me. So the media just came out and played for me. And I was like the biggest thing in Boston now, the biggest thing in Boston. And I got this thing in L.A. with a really – amazing post package attached to it and eventually stumble on a young distributor who's still my distributor to this day with all my films and a friend of mine, Anatol, and he pitches it to Netflix and I get a Netflix deal out of it. But the interesting thing about the Netflix deal was the girl in my movie, um, I ended up dating, but I was dating her sister first, then dating her, being a fucking mess, you know what I mean? Like I, I had, I had 
gotten rid of so many of my bad, you know, traits, like as far as like crime goes, but I still had these other things that I was just kind of fucked up, you know? So I get into a big fight with her and she calls the cops on me. They actually throw her out of my house, but then she goes and fucks the homicide detective that was in my movie, right? Because he always wanted to fuck her on set and was like jealous that I was fucking her. And so she goes and hooks up with him. He calls the police where I'm at and's like, you know, da, 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 da. she's got bruises on her legs. And she had bruises on her legs because I had a Rottweiler box of mix at the time that was very aggressive, like with especially with a female in the house. And so if anyone went near her, he was like, and so she would go out purposely and like run by construction sites, like in little tight shots, you know what I mean? To get guys to whistle or say something so that my dog would aggress at them. You know what I mean? She liked that. She liked that. She was that kind of girl. She liked that kind of like controversy. You know what I mean? And so one day she's out jogging them in her little Daisy Duke shorts with my, with my big dog and guys drove by in a truck. They said something to her and this was days before the incident. And my dog went crazy and went after the truck, wrapped the leash around her neck and dragged her like, you know, a fucking few feet or whatever. But she had like scrapes and bruises. But you could tell in the photos that they were old, that they weren't fresh from right. like the day of the incident with me and her. You could tell they were like dark and healing and whatever. Right. And so I ended up getting arrested for that. And then they hit me with a another charge in another state, which is very weird. Like so someone like. Listen, dirty cops exist. Um, so basically, I got held up in New Hampshire. They did it on purpose, so I couldn't get a bail for the interstate. So they would charge me with attempted murder for her because she said I I choked her and threw her down a flight of flight of stairs. And and I never had a all my crimes and things. And I've been a shitbag and I've done some horrible things, but I don't beat women. You know what I mean? Right. Like that. So that was the first time I've ever been charged with something like that. But you know, so I had that now <clears throat> because because she's saying I choked her. It's attempted murder. And then they tie me to a gun case. I was in an event a couple of weeks before that where um, I was doing like an appearance. Like they paid me to come hang out at the nightclub and gave us a bottle of vodka and all that bullshit. And some girl that was there, a woman that was there at that event that night, that venue that I knew nothing about, her gun went missing in the parking lot. And they had a list of like what was going on at the club last night, who was there because they were looking for this gun, right? Right. And so now because of this thing in um, – in mass with her now they pin that gun missing case on me with no video of me taking the gun no me nothing it's just a complete hearsay case but in new hampshire they can do these kind of things there's just a different criminal system up there and up there it's massachusetts is very liberal so the amount of crimes i've done in in boston throughout my histories and adolescent and stuff if i did those in like florida California, even as liberal as they are, or like New Hampshire, for, like I'd be smoked. I would never have gotten like the like ninety day bids and like these like. So they were trying to give me a um, a seven to twenty, right? Seven to twenty, right? It, seven it, to 20. Is your film done yet, or are they still editing the My film? Film's done. My film's done. My film's is edited. It, is and it I'm out? Trying, and nope, I'm trying to distribute it. So I make my Netflix deal from fucking jail where I'm being held. For an attempted murder on this girl that was in plays my girlfriend in the movie oxymorons mind you right and then okay. unlawful theft of a firearm class a felony in new hampshire on a gun that they didn't even give me a probable cause hearing on and my lawyer the same guy will corman represented me on both both cases right comes up to new hampshire to see me he's like johnny he's like they got nothing on you he's like but they're gonna take a pound of flesh out of you for whatever reason because of this cop you know what i mean like they just and he's like we're going to, the attempted murder is going to be gone. He's like, we'll beat that. He's like, you didn't do it. He's like, I got enough proof. The cops kicked her out of your house that day. And then all of a sudden the next day they get a call from the homicide detective that was in you. So there's all, there was enough in that, but it's still like a lot like to have to go to trial for attempted fucking murder after right. I had. And now mind you, I've had like fucking seven years, five to seven years of like not a fucking speeding ticket, like completely turning my life around, chasing my dreams, working a job for the first time, going to college, all these things. And a little girl too. I had my daughter, Jaybird. She was three at the time. So when they took me and held me in this six months for the, these cases, when I tell you that the six months that I was held in these cases was like 10 times longer than the three year bit I did because I have my little girl now and because I wasn't a criminal no more and I would legitimately wasn't guilty of any of this shit and i was like 
so in a fucking like panic attack of like and conspiracy theory of like how can they do this like i don't even know where this fucking gun is or anything to do with this gun and they're holding me on this with no like zero evidence right. and then and then and then this and then this bitch fucking making up you know just saying this shit about me and then going to fuck a cop to like work it against me so eventually we, we take it to trial so now i'm indicted in new hampshire on the gun charge so we take it to trial we go in front of a judge and and now i also have like people in massachusetts so like probation officers that were on like ran the heroin education awareness task people that were very proud of oxymorons like writing to like the the uh the district attorney up there and stuff saying like what's going on with this like did you know and they like looking at the, they're looking at the evidence and they're like like he didn't do this like people are fucking with him right now this kid's turned his life around like we truly believe right. that like like we need to like help so the so even the da at that point now was on my side when we went to the indictment with my lawyer like that they, they just wanted to give me time served so in order for me not to go to trial and risk going away forever i had to plead guilty to something i didn't do but whatever i get time served wrap it up the judge didn't want to do it she's like where's the gun and the judge in the, the fucking the da is like we don't have it she's like well wait i don't understand why is he being you know and so she's like i have to let him go and she didn't want she's like eve like and so they so they let me go from that so when they let me go from that uh the guys the the, the dea task force i was telling you about that were in my movie that you know came and yeah. played the they that they, they sent their task force guys to pick me up for the case in boston for the attempted murder and so when they got there they picked me up they didn't cuff me they just right. brought me in in the the ceos at the new Hampshire. Like, you're not gonna cuff him they're like johnny nah he's fucking good they get me in the car they got a coffee for me they got cigarettes i'm like i don't smoke anymore they're like all right whatever they're like yeah and they give me their cell phone you know call your lawyer call whoever you need because we got to bring you there but when we bring you in we're not giving them this case up here we're not going to let them know you're being held we're going to bring it in that you you turned yourself in on your own i was like oh my god all right cool like guys thank you and they're like we know the case is bullshit we know what's going on and I'm like, all right, so so do that. I go in, and the judge is like, I can't let you, I can't hear this today. I need his lawyer. Da da da. So I go back to the original jail where I did the three years. Now I'm held there overnight, and that place felt like fucking Disney World compared to like where I had just been in New Hampshire. I had was just in New Hampshire, and a complete like it's rated like one of the like the third worst living conditions in the country, or something next to like the one in New Mexico where they make you wear pink. That's up at this place. Right. Was. I lost my voice. I'm on the phone with my distributor. I, I, I couldn't even talk. Cause the other thing that happened is when they, so when they held me on the six months, cause it was like a hundred thousand dollars bail. And then the attempted murder had nothing, had no bail at the time. So I couldn't go nowhere. So it was like having no bail. And when I got to that facility, my uncle's friends did this bank robbery up there in the nineties uh, called the Hudson. And they killed the armored truck drivers in New Hampshire. Okay. And then yeah. And so I've heard of that case. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so Mike O'Halloran is like, he was my uncle's best friend who was in, part of that. I know, I know all the guys, but like Mike O'Halloran was uh, actually like very close to me and my family and like, look out for me when I was a kid, when my uncle was doing time, my uncle, the bank robber. So they were like this. So I knew Mikey very well and his whole family. And so they call us townies. Like, so that's what it says in my own, like townies. So townies right. is something. And everyone thinks it's a gang. It's not. My mother's a townie. My grandma, anyone, if you were born and raised in Charleston, you're a townie, a Charleston townie. That's just a thing. That's just like a neighborhood thing. But when I went to that jail in New Hampshire, because those when those guys went there, they tried to escape. They took COs hostage and shit after they killed these armored truck drivers in that jail that I was in. So when they seen my name, seen where I was from, from Charleston, seeing that I had an escape on my record, because even though it's kind of really a walk away from a minimum, it was labeled an escape as far as on paper goes. And they were like, you know, fuck this. And so they buried me in the hole. And I'm talking like their hole was like, luckily, if I got food one day, some days I didn't eat at all, you know, never got out to shower, maybe once a week. I was just like buried in a room, losing my mind, you know, completely like fucking losing my mind because I'm I went from like m living my dream, making a movie finishing and being in LA to like this psychotic girl causing all this shit for me. And, and, and I'm taken away from my little girl too, which was like the most important thing to me, who was three at the time. So I was just, my soul was ripped out of my chest and I literally lost my voice. Like I can talk obviously, and I have very good dialogue. I always did. 
and for whatever reason, when I would get on the phone, like to talk to my, I couldn't, I could barely talk. I was like, I was so broken inside. I was like really fucked up. But that being said, my, you know, I'm on the phone, with my distributor, the guy, and he's like, Johnny, I can get us a Netflix deal right now for like 90 K, you know, for an eight, 90, 90,000 dollars for, which was huge money for me at, the, at that moment for a night, for an 18 month license. And I'm like, do it. So I made my Netflix deal while being held, barely able to talk from that, that jail in New Hampshire. That's how I made my Netflix deal from jail. So I get out, my guys bring me that I know, bring me back to Middleton. I'm there for the night. And then I go back to court the next day. My lawyer's there, Will's there, and Will just fucking like attacks. And he's like, my client turned his life around. He made a move, you know, it just goes down the line. He's like, I got letters from probation offices, you know, state officials, everybody like saying that this guy is turned his life around and, and he's being held in attempted murder when two officers escorted her out of his apartment because she was being hostile in front of the officers. And he's like, and then the next day they charge him for an attempted murder, different officers, because she goes and she's having intimate relationships with the, and she's like, and we're going to plan on bringing him into the trial too. And so the judge is like, well, I can't, because of his record, I can't let him go on a personal. He's like, what can he get? And I had like two grand left to my name. And he looks at me and I'm like, and he's like, $2,000, Your Honor? He's like, okay, set bail $2,000. So I'm on an attempted murder case, $2,000 cash bail. So we right. know how weak the case is now at that point. But then, you know, there was a year of me going to trial, you know, waiting for her to show up, waiting for this one to show up. Who were they going to believe, you know? And no one showed up. No one made it. No one did it. You know, they get to go walk around and do that to me and then get to walk free after making those accusations, but not, not guilty. So beat that case and then had this like slump period where I was like, not beat up, but like I ended up with full custody of my daughter at the time who was now four. And I was just doing nightlife events, um, you know, like club appearances, booking DJs, booking comedians. And just, you know, there's the guy who made oxymorons. And was a filmmaker, but just now, like, trying to make money to survive and take care of my daughter. And kind of lost my way of, like, filmmaking for a moment. And then in 2016, I got cast in uh, a movie through my friend Tom Sizemore. Tom Sizemore ended up becoming a, the actor Tom Sizemore from Saving Private Ryan. Heat. He's the bank robber in Heat. Yeah, Black right. Black Down. He he died recently, right? Did he yeah, pass away? So, I, so he just passed away. Yeah. I, actually, hold on. I'll show you something. So Tom was a very good friend of mine. Um, there's a crazy story about when I was out in Hollywood and I met Tom and he was originally going to be in oxymorons, but he wasn't clean. He was still all, all fucked up on, um, on drugs. Fast forward though. I always maintained a friendship with him and could understand because of what I, you know, the world I'm from his addiction. Right. And, and I, and I, and I loved him and I looked up to him as an actor. And so he would do acting coaching with me every time I'd be in L.A. I'd go to his, whether he was living in a hotel or a condo or wherever, he was bounced around. He was a gypsy. Um, but I would hang out with him, with my daughter and everything. He was, he was actually a really good guy. Just drugs, you know, encompassed the, all the goodness in him. And uh, he, you know, obviously died recently. So this was his, uh, this is from his... His uh, right. memorial. Yeah. And then um, if you look uh, right there. Right. Johnny Hickey. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, was one of the guest, yeah, I was one of the guest speakers at his memorial and spoke at his memorial and told the story of Tom and how we were friends and because his management knew how close me and Tom really were. Um, so yeah, so Tom, Tom was a friend of mine and he got me, he got me a role in this movie, uh, this MMA movie, they were called the uh, blood circus. It's on Paramount as a, an MMA fighter in this movie. And I did some of the fight choreography cause they loved the fight choreography I did in oxymorons cause I make everything look real. I don't, right. I don't want it to be, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. There's a scene in oxymorons where I have the kid playing my brother. I'm like, dude, this is going to look so stupid if you don't just really punch me in the face. I'm like, don't punch me in the nose. Don't punch me in the mouth or the eye. Like, aim for my head. I'm going to lean my head down when I come in the cell and just hit me in the head. And he blasts me in the forehead. We fall back. We have this whole fight scene. And earlier in the movie, 
even though it was shot after that scene, but it takes place earlier in the storyline. You see a bruise on my head when we're cutting up drugs at the table. There's just like bruise on my head. And that's from me letting him punch me dead in the fucking face so that it looked good, you know? Yeah. So Tom got me so Tom got me into that. So 2016 I did um that movie and I was like, what am I doing? I'm like, why am I doing like events? I need to I'm a fucking filmmaker, you know, and I was sick of, you know, the social media warriors and the haters being like, one hit wonder, yeah, it's easy to do a movie about. You know, it's like you know, people hate. So yeah, uh, people, yeah. now I, I've reached a level now where I'm like, you know, when people hate on me and talk shit about me and say things about me. I laugh because it's like, yeah, you have to talk about me because if you talk about yourself, nobody's listening. That's what I tell yeah. them. It fucks them all up. You know what I mean? Because it's the truth. Because if they go on and start talking about themselves, no one cares. But if they go on and start talking shit about me, now they, now they have now they have some attention. So they use me renting space in their head to get attention. So it's helped me grow in so many ways, these, these things, like between my, my life, the streets, fakeness the pyramid schemes and then like the film industry and i think that's why i've been able to kind of evolve in the film industry world because i can just read through the bullshit and i've been through so much that all the hollywood shit's like easy for me to kind of sift through and then find the real ones like you know guys like like tom my buddy um and so he got me that and then i said all right it's on to the next thing what do i want to do and i always wanted to make a movie about the rave scene and I love horror, so I decided to write this psychological horror film called Habitual, which is about a group of like young adults going to rave parties, doing ecstasy in Mali, because that's popular again. And they go into this rave in this abandoned lunatic asylum. And so, again, I pulled the Johnny Hickey, like, you know, I'm making a movie to showcase, you know, collateral damage of drugs. I need, and I got permission to go into all these abandoned state hospitals that I like. You know, we're talking like the equity of like the set design of what those things look like for a fucking yeah. movie. Next, like it's just ridiculous. And so we shot in all these abandoned lunatic asylums in the dead of winter. And it's about kids doing Molly that's cut with fentanyl. You know what I mean? It's cut with fentanyl and kids are dropping dead from doing designer drugs, which is a whole new generational thing where you got these kids that aren't even opiate addicts. But they're doing something that they think they're doing coke, you know what I mean, at a, at a bar, college kids, and it's fentanyl and they're dying. So I wanted to make that the next chapter of my kind of niche, like drug thing that's going on because fentanyl is a, a problem and kids doing substances that they don't really know where it comes from are, are dying because they're doing something they don't even know they're doing. So that's what habitual. So the habitual isn't like Oxy where it's based on a chapter of my life. But the crime drama element of it, the first half hour of the movie is like a crime drama, like kids partying, doing drugs. So they do some bad shit, like as far as like they do some like grimy street shit and hurt somebody. And they end up going to this rave in this abandoned lunatic asylum. And when they get there, it turns into a mind fuck psychological horror film. So it shift gears real fast, really dark, really gory. Um, and I just always wanted to do something like that. So that was my second film. Uh, we won again. We won a ton of awards for that. We had a theatrical release, and it put me on a, it put me in a new position of like connections in LA, networking. Uh, me as a filmmaker now. Now that I have two movies under my belt, and in kind of like obviously the niche market that I'm going to, and also tying into all these anti-drug groups and stuff like that, and building that cult following kind of with people that like dark crime dramas. They don't have to have been affected by drugs, but at this point in today's society. It doesn't matter if you did drugs, like someone in your family, your brother, your cousin, your boss. Some, yeah, you're you affected know. somehow. You're affected. You know that you know what you know. Yeah, you've been, you know, your best friend's daughter. You know, just something horrible, you know, has happened, if not a ton. Right. So. So that's kind of my audience has become these people that love the rawness and the realness of these movies and this content that I'm making because it, it I don't glamorize shit. I don't candy coat stuff. I'm very raw, real. And I'm also, you know, you know, I don't have millions of fans, but I have hundreds of thousands of people over the course of the last, you know, 10 years, say, since Oxymorons was made that reach out to me even still to this day. And are like, dude, I have my my kids back and my life changed because of your movie. And, you, you know, like I had a woman come up to me and tell me her and her husband 
got like seven years clean now because they watched my movie together and decided to get clean after watching oxymorons and i always said like if one person watched oxymorons and it deterred them and, and helped them get off drugs and i like changed the world like i did my justice and after it became one person to like a thousand people i was like wow okay i have to like that's why i'm doing this that's why i survived the 80 foot fall that's why i have the willpower and the manifestation to fight through all this bullshit is to continue not make content that's just making content to be hollywood or to be a movie star and to be famous it's to really make content that people connect with and can change their lives and, and bring awareness without being you know candy coated you know don't do drugs and put drugs all in one basket you know yeah listen all that hollywood shit wouldn't make you happy anyway in the end no no, no, no. I've seen. I, I, I've been out in Hollywood. I've lived in Hollywood. I see it all. It's so, so fake. In, in a million yeah, ways. I was gonna say they're all miserable out there. It's, yeah, it's you know, mm -hmm. like I was. So I like I've had tons of money, tons of people pretending to be my friends. You know, like prior to going to prison, thought I was super. Mm -hmm. Thought I was happy. And that's it. Was all bullshit. All yep. bullshit. No. Yep, it is. But yeah, you've I got like you. You know, you've got a. a you have a, a purpose now, you know, mm -hmm. which changes yeah, everything. So I just did this, um, we just wrapped this, I guess you'd call it a pilot, like for a TV series or a short film. It's 25 minutes long, but it's called Method Mile. And it's about Method Mile in Boston, which is this, um, it's like probably three to four block radius where the South Bay Correctional Facility, so the County Jail of Boston, South Bay, three methadone clinics, two homeless shelters in Boston Medical Center, which is like the nastiest hospital in Boston, which is where I was when I fell off the cliff, all intersect. And it's become a skid row of Boston, like safe haven for drug addicts, which we know that's a bunch of fucking bullshit. It's just like a place to like keep everybody, you know, in the revolving door dying, you know. Um, and it's, you know, a tent city. And when I made oxymorons and was exposed in the opiate epidemic to the public in, in Massachusetts and beyond, we didn't like the methadone clinics were down there, but we didn't have like this homeless population where people were allowed to like sleep down there in tents. Cops aren't allowed to do anything. I could walk up to you, hand you a fucking brick of fentanyl, and the cops can't do anything about it if it's in that area. They just unless someone's dying or getting stabbed, they're not allowed to do anything. I mean, there's people having sex on the stairs in front of kids going by on bus brutal you know that they allow this to happen so i just did a narrative uh pilot I'd like to turn it into a series we could go feature film with it but we made a really really like it's just like well shot and it's just probably the best work i've done even though it's a, a smaller version of the things i've done it's probably the best thing i've done as far as like the quality the cast um i was able to tom was going to play the dad in it and um i cast tom and he came on board to play the role of the dad i think about a week before he, before he passed away before he took a stroke and so then i had to find somebody to take his place and i ended up going back to that guy lenny clock the comedian that hooked me up with dennis leary's people and right you know what i mean because i never worked with him again since then and then he's the perfect like boston guy he's like and he's been on drugs in his past and you know been on a boozer and he was a street guy and he's a brilliant comedian. He's a brilliant actor. He was just in the new Halloween movie. He had a pretty decent role in that. Um, and I was like, Lenny's the guy. So let me see if Lenny wants to do this. So I pitched it to Lenny. Lenny was like, anything. He's like, I'll take a bullet for you, Johnny. Those are his exact words, which is like, you know, very honorable that I've earned that kind of reputation now with guys like him that he's willing just to come on board and help. And then uh, this girl, Justina Valentine, who's huge on MTV, she's on um while and out she like raps and battles dudes and she's like really witty and she's like a verbal assassin and she wanted to get into acting and she was really supportive of like oxymorons and the, and the stuff i was doing and she's got a huge fan base she's got you know like 15 million followers on TikTok, 5 million on instagram and she's just real and she was so adamant about like learning the boston accent which is very important like you say like the movies like the potted where even the boston actors don't eat that sounds fake and so I was like, if she can do this, like I would cast her, you know, but like, and she did it, man. She studied and she practiced and she hung out with me and my friend, Jimmy LeBlanc, who's from South Boston. He's a boxer. He's a bunch of Boston movies and she like 
learn the accent to like you you would think that she's from south boston or something so she plays the lead missy in this i play the brother i also co-wrote directed it wore a bunch of hats on it typically is just how i have to do things right now to get them done and then lenny plays the dad and it's just a really good crime drama about a dysfunctional family whose lives all intersect in this methadone mile kind of world um and that one is getting me a lot of attention it's something that like you say for the purpose i think i'd like to tour in high schools across the country um i already did a test screening in maine which is like two states up from us here in mass just because one of the executive producers is kind of politically tied there so we got like the governor a senator we got all these people coming on board to support it and get it into the schools and stuff which would be great, which is really what I'd like to do with my content is, yeah, have it be out in streaming world and obviously make it an income so I don't have to work a nine to five and I can do this full time like I have been. And I don't I don't work a nine to five. This is my full time job since right. Oxy's speaking minus those events I was doing. Um, and so Oxy does well and Habitual does well for me, but be able to like tour schools and like really, you know, utilize my content is a deterrence because it's not candy coated and it's raw and it's gritty and it's the stuff that the kids are seeing on, you know, the stuff they see on TikTok is worse than like my movie stuff that's actually like educational for them in, in a sense. So bringing this into schools where kids are going to connect with me in this content more than the cop coming and being like, dear, you know, weed is bad. So is in heroin. Apples and oranges? No, no. Apples and oranges, yes. Like you can't go in and tell them to stop vaping and tell them to stop smoking weed. That like you got to like kind of pick and choose your battles. And this right. opiates and fentanyl and pills that are cut with this is what we need to stop. We need to, we don't want these kids to end up creating you know what what they want, which is this overflow population of drones and just dumbed down population where it's okay to have this whole section of a uh, city tied up with people living in tents and dying on drugs. Right. right. So that's kind of what my mission. Is, is becoming with this now. All right. Well, when's that? And, and so you've done a, a pilot or are you pitching it or is it already been picked up somewhere? Yeah. Oh, just... no. So we're in, we're in post-production right now. So we're about to picture lock this week. So I have, I can send you actually, you got to, you know, keep it close to your chest, obviously, but um, I can send you the rough cut so you can check it out. Um, right. It's about 20, 25 minutes long, but it's very watchable. It has a score. It, it has to go into final color, final sound design, final sound mix and some visual effects um, just for some like little stupid things. But but it's very watchable right now as a screener. Like it's, there's music, there's a score that everything sounds and looks great. And the story is very, very beautiful, very put together well. Um, so we have an option already on the table from a big company. I can't say who, but to fund it as a feature film. But we're also shopping it as a pilot for a series because series is really where the longevity is with something like this. Right. So two reasons. One, the big streaming sites like Netflix and stuff, they would rather have a series, even if it's a mini series, than a feature because the more content that keeps them, keeps the viewer on their platforms, the better. That's how they look at it now. Whereas right. And before, people stick around instead of for four months, they stick around for five years, six years, seven right. years. They keep coming exactly. back for, yeah. Yeah. Or even, or even if they're just on that platform for four hours as opposed to one hour, right? One and a half right. hours. So, so just even that alone, and the interview have longevity of like season out season, yeah, it keeps people tied in. So that, that's what they want. Um, so we're trying to take it that route. But, you know, the all else feels like option right now is that we have bigger funding to do it as a feature, which is also great. And we have it written both as episodic one season we have about seven episodes done almost actually eight episodes done and then we have it as a feature version too where like a lot of this stuff is chopped out and the rest of it's encompassed in this feature film that is also just as great so whatever home it's going to find it's going to find but it's out in la right now i work at sugar studios la out in hollywood that's kind of my post house my editor, Paul Buell, the guy that cut Oxymorons, is now the – I brought him out to L.A. with me with Oxy. And since then, he's become a big editor at this big studio. So my guy that I brought out with my first film is now the senior editor at Sugar Studios L.A. 
and he's like Rob Schneider's editor, Michael Polish. He edits for all these big name direct, but he's my guy still and will always. So now, you know, he's part of the, he's in the union out there and everything. And he just, so I have all this equity now built for me in LA where this post house is, it's like friends and family rates and stuff like that. So I'm able to kind of navigate these um, kind of low budget independent films into equity that is, makes it a much higher production value. Right. So I would say we're going to do screenings with it. We're going to tour it. Um, like we're submitted to some big festivals, but we're also going to tour it in cities. Like I'll definitely end up coming down to Florida. Like I said, I recently spoke to Jim Brewer, who's down in Florida, wants me to maybe come on his podcast. Um, I go down to Miami and, and stuff a lot too anyway. So I'd like to do like Florida, Philly, Chicago, you know, the cities that I kind of hit hard with this, obviously, and the OB Epidemic, which everywhere, but like specific ones also where I know I have audiences and do pop-up screenings with Q&As after dialogue like this tell my story ask me a question but you know what i mean whoever it is and and kind of bring it around to communities like that i think it's how because because it's a pilot version and then as we're doing that you know maybe the other, so one of the other things too is uh like massachusetts just got their 900 million dollars for the purdue pharma lawsuits after all this time so each state is getting their their money now for the the you know amount of people that purdue pharma killed and got away with um, right. So nine hundred million dollars, Massachusetts got a portion of that has to go into education and prevention, and I think what I'm doing falls into that bracket. So if I can, I might be able to tap into funding from the state that could potentially fund the series of the movie, because again, the stuff is proven, you know, time and time again to help people, you know, really want to get clean. So, which is more than what anything else is doing as far as like methadone and suboxone and the revolving door of, of addiction. Okay. Well, I mean, let me know. Keep me, keep me, you know, let me know if, uh, you know, whenever this happens, you could, we could always do another episode on it, right? Like on what's happening. Yeah, I love to. I mean, yeah. And, and, yeah, and I gave you, I mean, we, I started late today because it's my fault, but, um, you know, I there's so much there's so much story I, I jumped out of, you know what I mean? I, I kept right. it kind of, I kept it kind of the progression of like my childhood, you know, into high school, a little bit stuff about my uncle and like, you know, G, my, my bits and pieces of my criminal life into becoming a filmmaker. But there is big sections left out, which would be great for another, you know, another uh, run. Maybe what would be great is we do one, you know, down the pipeline after you get to check out my films more and kind of, you know, learn more about those and how I did stuff or why I did stuff, what, what's based on true stuff. And, you know, well, um, a lot of people ask me, like, I was going to say, I was going to say, we, we can put the links in the description box, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. For, um, for oxymorons and, uh, I want to say habitual, habitual, like habitual offender. Yeah. Yeah. Habitual. Yeah. Habitual. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. other stuff's not out yet, so. No, the other stuff's not out yet. I have other stuff out that I'm in and stuff, but it's not my stuff, and it's not the, the, what, you know, what your audience is too, which is like true crime and, right. you know, and um, true crime and, uh, you know, drugs and stuff like that. I am doing a documentary too right now about the housing development I grew up in, the Bug Hill Project called The Dying Breed. I'll send you the proof of concept for that too. Um, I'm going to put that up on my YouTube channel because I haven't gone public with it yet. But I'm doing a true crime docu-series about the housing development I grew up in dating back to, you know, dating back to when they built them in the 1930s for Irish veterans that were longshoremen. Right. And they literally, the BRA burned people's homes down to build this housing development that generation after generation has experienced just horrific stuff. You know, you have... The race riots of the 70s, the 49 unsolved murders still to this day, you know, there's probably bodies buried in there. Uh, and the reason I'm doing this documentary is because they're tearing them down because now it's the highest real estate. It's on the water in Boston. It's like the highest real estate in Boston, my neighborhood, Charlestown. It's not what it was. Like my neighborhood that I grew up in and the dangerous, you know, psychotic stuff that was going on is is just, you know, it's flatlined, flatlined. It's high end big money people, 
multi-million dollar condominiums and homes, and then this housing development that's just an eyesore on the water across from the new casino they built. So, of course, they're going to tear them down. They're tearing 1,100 um, three-story units into 3,000 10-story units that will be high-end housing development, right? So they're displacing 1,000 families throughout the city. They'll just scatter them wherever they scatter them. And then they're building this thing that's supposed to be this beautiful thing. And it's just going to erase the history of what has gone on there all these years. You know, the unsolved murders, the bank robbers. So I'm doing these true crime episodes. In, you know, in my research, I found out that in the late 1500s, the first woman ever executed, a first person ever executed uh, for witchcraft in the history of the United States was a woman, Margaret Jones, who was hung in that same area where that housing development is and the little boy that was involved in that case when she was a midwife and the governor signed off on them hanging her um he was the priest that inspired the salem witch trials years later no one knows this i mean unless you're a history like buff and you go that far back so the history of the housing development and like the cursed things that have gone on there even the 1700s the battle of bunker hill you know where, where all this bloodshed took place has gone on since the 1500s there, you know, all the way up until, you know, the Oxycontin craze and now the things that go on there now. So I'm going to do this whole like true crime series documentary style of, of that as well. So I can update you more on the next time we talk on where that's at, but I'll get you the proof of concept. It's really solid. And it's gives you kind of a history quick, you know, seven minute history of like of that development that I grew up in. Okay. I was going to say yeah. tearing them down and building something new may, and erasing that part of history may be a part of the uh, overall plan, you know, well, for the developers or for the no, city. Of course it is. And, you know, this, this is the world we live in, right? So it's like real estate property. It will make it clean, a better place. But it displaces the people. And, you know, the way I look at it is like I go down to Charlestown all the time to the projects because I don't live there no more. And I remind myself of like, this is where I came from. And I filmed my movies there. And I did a little horror series for Scan Network too, that I filmed some scenes in there as well. It's just like a horror series, not about drugs or anything. But um, I always go back there and I'll like go up on a rooftop and I'll just sit there and I'll like meditate and just like reminisce, you know, of like how bad it was there when I was growing up, all the horrors I've seen, all the, you know, a million things that I left out of this, this dialogue with, me, with you. Um, and where I'm at now and how I survived that. And so that's my neighborhood. It's like going back to your home, your, you know what I mean? So imagine going back to your house that you grew up in as a kid and it's just gone. It's just torn down and there's another house there. It's all right. That's one thing. But imagine, where'd you, where'd you grow up? What neighborhood? Uh, Temple Terrace. It's like, kind of like a, sub, a suburb of Tampa, Florida. All right. So imagine going back to Temple Terra and it's just completely torn down. Like it just right. nothing exists that you remember no more. It's just all new buildings, like nothing, the corner stuff, not just the stores and the and anything like they just, every home, every street has changed. So that's why I'm doing it is like, just to, just to ha- let it have its piece of history. You know what I mean? Right. And let those stories not be, be forgotten and be told through the docu-series of like what went on there. And, and then if anything else crazy happens there, even when it turns into a high end place, you know, it just reflects that the energy of that place is so bad because so many bad things have happened there that, you know, maybe that's why these things continue to happen there. So, um, so it's something else that I'm doing that, I, that's another project that I'm, that I'm on right now. Okay. Do you feel like there's, there's anything else you want to cover or you feel good about this? I feel good. Yeah. 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 I'm good. Yeah. I gotta go pick up my, um, I gotta go pick up my oldest in 15 minutes and, and pick up my little one 10 minutes after that. But yeah, I think, uh, I think we did good on this one. Unless there's anything else you want to ask or no, I'm good. Do you have any social media links or anything? Do you have like Instagram or Facebook, anything? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. So everything is so Instagram. I'm heavy on. That's kind of like where I'm, I maintain most of my stuff, but right. everything, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, um, Facebook, the Johnny Hickey, everything's the Johnny Hickey. So the J O H N N Y H I C K E Y. And um, okay. I'll, I'll send that stuff to you as well. I'm, um, I'm taking, I had an old YouTube channel and the, the Johnny Hickey is my new one because it's where all my, you know, everything else I want, might as well keep everything the same. It just makes sense. And so right. I just have to upload a bunch of content this week up there. I'm going to do that. 
So I'll have a bunch of my old videos, new stuff that's never been seen before. I'm just going to kind of organize that and, and have a nice YouTube page going uh, this week. But Instagram's really where I'm heavy at. If people ever want to reach out to me, ask me a question, contact me. They have an idea they want to throw at me. I'm very responsive with other people as long as they're not weird. You know, I'll, I'm always, I always try to like give back and right. respond to people. So uh, Instagram, always people DM me on there. I'll, I'll, I'll eventually hit you back. And then Facebook, Twitter, you know, the Johnny Hickey. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching. I hope you like this interview. I'm going to leave all of Johnny's social media links in the description box. We're also going to leave the links to his movies. I hope you guys liked it. Let me know if you didn't. Let me know if you did. If you did, do me a favor and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you get notified. Share the video because sharing the video really does help with the algorithm. Leave me a comment. I really appreciate it. If you're interested in being a guest, please hit me up. My email is in the description box also. Really appreciate you guys watching. See ya. So you sent me a you sent me an email. We talked on the phone a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Alaska. The yeah. credit card thing. Were you born in Alaska? I was born and raised in North Pole, Alaska. Not the North Pole, but North Pole, Alaska. Born and raised there. Um, I had a, uh, I mean. Well, can I stop? One more. Can I stop? What was it? Were you in Alaska? Were you from Alaska? Like We were both born and raised. Neither one of you look like someone that I think. See, when I think Alaska, I, I, I think Native Alaskans because I've seen all those programs like, like, um, Alaska life, state life troopers. below zero yeah. And, and, and and yeah and alaska state troopers and all those and uh but i saw one where they were like it was almost like a tribe or something like yeah. they were they were running their own the whole town was run by basically like a tribe and yeah we're it's not like that i mean we're probably like thirty thousand people population at so north pole and then there's fairbanks so north pole and fairbanks are only like 10 miles away so like if you you live in north pole most of your jobs are in fairbanks you got to commute 15 minutes but it's probably about 30,000 people population uh there there is a, a lot of natives um where was mostly. twilight filmed twilight is that alaska no are they in alaska that movie with vanessa hutchinson when she's the prostitute in prostitute that's not, no that's not in twilight? no no there was one that's shot in no wow that was way off <laughs> Oh yeah, there's is that there's, a true, and that's a true. That's story? a true one. Do you hear that? You need to get that, dude. <laughs> <laughs> what the the hunting the prostitutes? <laughs> based off a true story that happened in Alaska. That wow. Like, yeah. Probably. Do you hear that? It's a, it's a yeah. There's a car alarm going off. Yeah. Anyways, so I'm sorry. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Okay. So we don't know. We don't know where Twilight was. It, this is nothing to do with anything. No, anyway, no. Sorry, I don't think ahead. it has anything to do with Alaska. Um, but I, I mean, I had a fairly normal childhood. Um, I there's, I mean, there's some trauma. You know, I mean, there's there's things that I went through. I felt like I never really kind of fit into the norm. I always felt kind of odd. I'd only had like one best friend. Um, I, there was just. I felt like there was just. <laughs> It's hard to explain. I just, there was something different about me that I didn't fit in with most people. I got picked on and stuff and just because I was quiet. And then, I mean, eventually it led to like in my, before high school. So I started drinking like 13, 14 years old and tried weed. And were you, your parents married? They were, they were both they're, together? They're both together and they're still together. Yeah. And they're just like a normal, like middle class kind of. Yeah. But you just wasn't it wasn't working for you no you it, it wasn't and so at the time let's see my dad has been in recovery for almost as long as i've been alive so they were doing the best with what they had they were growing as i was growing all right so they had they had to learn how to parent and like the older i got like the better that they did like i they're the best parents now that I've ever had. Right. Like they've they've done a great job, like supporting me, especially everything that I've went through. Um, do you have any brothers and sisters? I do have a brother and a sister, um, but they're the uh, same dad, different mom. So half half right. brother and half sister. Um, but they're see my four older, way older. Yeah, my sister's right. forty three or forty four, and then my uh, brother's like forty one. Forty three, forty four. She's only they're almost dead. No shit. I mean, I'm I'm thirty three. I mean, so I'm like. I'm 53. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Wow. 
43 is ancient. Uh, yeah. My God. Yeah. <laughs> she, I just heard them over there. And she's like, and I'm only 22. I'm a decade older yeah. than her. Um, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> like them young, they're, 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 uh, they're they'll put shapeable. You, they'll, yeah, yeah. They'll put you in your place real quick. No. They, <laughs> yeah, they will. Um, and then, I mean, so eventually, um, kind of led to like it's when when I had my my first drink or my first mind altering substance. How like, old were you? I was like thirteen. Wow, how does that happen? I I mean, my sister always had had pills oh, okay. or had drugs. I mean, my best friend at the time he he had a bunch of weed all the time, and then his parents were kind of out of town or not really just present enough to to notice that what we were doing and uh i i would drink beer and then i'd smoke weed and my i had a, like a little yamaha blaster and i would after i got all hammered and shit i would drive home and try to avoid my parents and not let, let them know that i was under any kind of influence um but it what it did is it triggered something like inside of me that felt like i was like this is how i'm supposed to feel like right like uh, it, just an a total addict like kind of personality like i'm an addict through and through and like no matter what it is that'll get me outside of my head to make me feel not make me feel that's the point is right there's too much going on all the time and the instant that i like i had that stump since i was like i can i can talk to people like i'm i feel calm i i, I have like uh i can communicate properly and i felt like people liked me so i uh continued with with that through my high school years um i would hide a bottle of soco behind my subwoofer in my truck and before i'd go into into class i'd take a few shots and go into class and i'd be like i i, I was cool like i felt good yes you're self-medicating oh uh, yeah it's, it's anxiety it's got to be it it sounds i mean not that i'm a psychiatrist or anything but it, it sounds like it's super connected to anxiety for it you it definitely is yeah i was i'm totally uncomfortable with myself if i if i wasn't under a sub under any kind of substance right um there's just it uh, it's it's it's, hor it's horrible really until until you reach a point in your life where you're like i'm i need to do something about this like i need to change um but uh after going through like um going through high school and drinking while going to school and not getting in trouble or anything i was gonna I, say I, didn't it, it never caught up never no, caught up to you nobody ever not, nobody noticed they just they just thought like matt's in a, in a good mood like how i usually was because i was always under a substance right and then um after high school i was like it was yeah right after high school um i had a buddy that i would go to so in i went to school in in Eilson, which is an uh, air force base uh, because I went to North Pole High and I got too much too much in trouble or just there's things going on and I went to Ielson so they sent me there plus I had a girlfriend at Ielson that I, I wanted to go to Ielson so I could be with her right and uh, that lasted like two months so I ended up fin finishing junior senior year at Ielson and then uh, I had friends that went to West Valley and I would go go see them and then we were kind of into the same substances and same things and then that's when the uh the oxycontin thing kind of arose right um and that was in let's see 2009 2010 and uh we figured out like you know you can smoke them you can smoke on tinfoil because these oxycontin 80 milligrams i mean they're synthetic heroin right like that's exactly what it is and i never in my life thought of a smoking a pill what are you like what are you guys doing and um one of one of these particular persons is one ended up being one of my co-defendants in in this thing um so me and him we would i would go to his house and we would smoke oxycontin off tin foil and then i did that like off and on for like you know a few weeks or then three weeks four weeks and then I just I stopped. I was sit, I was back in North Pole at my parents' house, and um, I started feeling like shit. I was like, man, I must be getting the flu. Like I just I don't feel good. And then it dawned on me. I was like, wait a second. I'm I'm withdrawing. Yeah. I'm going through withdrawals. Like, what do I do? Like, I, I either I need to go get more, or I'm just this is gonna get. I'm gonna feel like shit. So 
I asked my parents, I'm like, just some phony fucking reason. Like, hey, I need uh, $80 to go to, uh, to fill up my tank and go do this and do this. And um, at that point in time, they didn't, I don't think they had an idea. I mean, there was, they didn't have an idea that I was up to something. And um, I went and got the Oxycontin and then I smoked it and I instantly feel better. So I was like, okay, I, this is it. I'm hooked. Like right. I, I, I have to do this now in order to function. And, and this is an 80 milligram. Oxy. Yeah. So what do you, you're, you break it in half or you something? can't, yeah. Or they, they, yeah. You can hawk it. Right. So you bite it in half. And so then you put, put one side down. The 80 is like the controlled release, right? Like, it, no, back then it was, it was the original Oxycot until they switched it over the, to the OPs. Okay. So the OPs, they, like they had a, a plastic in there where you, you couldn't smoke it. You couldn't, the original ones, you can inject them. You could smoke them. You could do, snort them anything and uh um shit where was i i'm sorry you were you were saying you smoked it and you said okay i'm I'm, I'm, yeah i'm definitely hooked yeah this is this is yeah this is it like i'm i'm either going to have to support my habit in order so i don't feel sick or just stop and at that i kind of had the realization like that i don't want to stop because it makes me feel better it makes me feel normal i have no anxiety um do you have a job at this time I yeah mean, so i was working at a small engine repair shop also where my co-defendant worked um and uh so we were both i mean we're hooked on the shit and then we'd come to work and like we're sharpening chains and we're just like oh, i feel like shit and like look over at him and like you you feel like shit too he's like yeah we need to get something and then we find a way to come up with money or it's whatever and uh we'd go for our lunch breaks and find one go get high come back to work and put all these engines engines apart or together and start sharpening chains and got all our energy back and everything and then uh he he ended up leaving because he got a new job at a, a constru- construction company a fairly large construction company in fairbanks and uh, i continued just doing my own thing and uh m- making money through through the through the job that i had but then also making up phony fucking lies to my parents why i need this money and i need this money i need this for this i need this for this or my insurance or my gas or like uh i want to take a girl out on a date like i mean right how old were you at this time i think uh 19 19 going on 20 um <clears throat> and then it came to the point where uh so my like i said my dad's in recovery so my truck was acting up and we pulled it into the garage and he was helping me work on it. And he goes, Matt, you, you know, I know you're there. You're up to something. And I just want to let you know that like, whatever you're doing, you're going to only end up in three places. You're going to end up in either in jail or an institution, or you're going to die. And then <clears throat> your friends, you're not the girlfriend that I had. You're going to lose your girlfriend. You're going to lose your truck. You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose everything. Yeah, and then eventually you're going to lose the the connection or you're not your family's not going to want to be around you anymore and uh i didn't that just went yeah yeah right on. i was you're like 19 yeah. years old i was like what are, yeah you, a you, you drug don't addict. yeah you don't know you've, you've only been clean and sober for 15 years right um <clears throat> uh well at that time it would have been 19 years and uh yeah one ear out the other and like told me straight up like uh, i i knew where i was heading and then about uh maybe a month into it um my co-defendant uh told me that he's he's getting ready to leave the state because he's got another job from this construction company that he's moving to like a different state or whatever and he has he has a gas car that he's been using to obviously fill up the fleet for the construction company all the all the trucks and then (laughs) And then he's, and he's like, I've been using it for my personal vehicle. And then he's like, so I get free gas. And then I've been filling up, you know, my brothers. I've been filling up this person. I've been doing this. Yeah, because they have a ton of vehicles that have to be t- – So yeah. they're not going to notice a slight fluctuation of a few hundred here, no. a few hundred there. No, because they have an entire fleet. <clears throat> and um, so he's getting ready to take off. And uh, he's like, you know, you, you can have this if you want. I was like, well, fuck yeah. Yeah, I'll get free gas because then I can save money for my drugs. But he's like, you know, you could, you know, you can make money off of it. 
And I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, you know, I, I charge people just blah. I don't know what I'll take 20 bucks off or just like for, for my friends. And uh, I was like, just that idea, just, just the idea that he planted, like it, I just took off with it, totally took off with it. I ended up, uh, so I would sit, <clears throat> I would sit at any gas station. So in Alaska, there's, there's Tesoros. That's what the gas, gas stations are. And I would sit there <clears throat> and I just, I, I'd wait in my car and I'd go up to anybody. I mean, it's usually it's like little old ladies or whoever. And I had like a sales pitch for this, I guess this gas card. <clears throat> and uh, so I'd go up to him and be like, oh, ma'am, I have a, uh, a gas card from the state um, and I, I have to use a specified amount of gallons. And if I don't, they're not going to reimburse me these gallons. Just, I just totally made that up the first time that I went up to this lady and I asked. And I was like, I'll, I'll fill up your vehicle and I'll take 20 bucks off. Like, uh, like if it's $80, just give me 60 bucks cash. And she's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, because she thinks she's like helping me out. Right. And I mean, I didn't necessarily look like I was strung out on drugs or anything. Right. And <clears throat> and in Alaska, I mean, you you know, and people are fucked up. Like the it's it's not hard to miss. Right. Um, and so I kept that little sales pitch and I would go up like shit. I'd go from one person, like just right there, and then on the other side, I'd give them the sales the same sales pitch. And they'd be like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, whatever. Like however much it is, like I just take 20 bucks off or I'll do this or just how, how much, how much cash do you have right now? I'll fill it up. Just give me all your cash. And they're like, oh, all right. Yeah, for sure. And then, um, I'm still working full time. And then on my lunch breaks, I would go do this. And so just in the span of like at a lunch break and talking to, three or four people with that little sales pitch, I'd make six, $700 on my lunch break in 30 minutes. Right. And um, <clears throat> then on the weekends, uh, you know, that's pretty much where I spent most of my time. And then all, of course, all this money. In Alaska, Oxycontin got up to one pill, could, it was two to $300 for one pill. For an 80. For, for an 80. Per, so yes. How, what is that a milligram like fucking that's like like 10 15 bucks a milligram yes yes okay. so it was outrageously priced and um <clears throat> so even me making 800 dollars a day i could get maybe two or three pills right and my i mean my tolerance is already going through the roof so that that's enough to keep me well Right. And so I'd wake up and just fuck, I, I don't have any energy, I'm sick. So I'd like, then when you're sick and withdrawing, and I go up to these gas stations and like, I'm just like, guy, I, I just need, you know, like, and I'm fumbling over my words and shit. And uh, still, I mean, it still worked. Yeah. Um, Are you giving people a, a reason to do it? Even if they think, ah, something's fucked up. If, but if, let's face it, if I get a, if I got, a, if I get 15 gallons of gas, you know, they, fills up my tank like i don't have to give him the money until after so yeah sure let's see what happens here bro right the card works it fills it up cool yeah like he you know if the cop showed up i'd be like whoa, whoa, whoa he told me this and that yeah, i didn't know yeah, they're totally unsuspected they have they have no idea they're well nothing. i mean even if they had an idea at least you gave them an excuse no you, you don't understand this is what he said golly gee whiz <gasps> are you <laughs> saying the card was stolen officer yeah you know exactly. at least yeah to me i would immediately well, yeah, of be course, like, other people be like, yeah, this seems pretty fucking fishy. Yeah, yeah. But the way that I said it, and then, then I mean, of course, like I said, the, probably the way that I looked probably helped a little bit better too. Right. Uh, and so, it got to the point where I would have, like, I was a gas dealer, pretty much. I would, I had taxis and semis. So, semis. I was, I was thinking, I would have gone straight, straight to a truck stop. Yeah. Because those guys are spending a thousand dollars. Exactly. And that's what I ended up doing. And so, they would, I had taxis and semis that would call me probably, you know, four or five times a week. Their semi is like five, six hundred dollars. Wow. And of so semis, they have to pay for their, their own gas. And, uh, I was like, dude, I'll take two hundred dollars off of that, even if it's seven or eight. And he's like, no doubt. Right. There you go, man. And um, that went on for so you can be you can be pretty generous when it's somebody else's money. I'm I'm always when I'm 
when I have when I've stolen a bunch of money from the bank, I'm pretty generous with their money too. Yeah, it's easy. It's easy. It makes you feel good. <laughs> yeah, it makes you feel like you know I'm, I'm doing a, the right thing. Yeah, I'm doing you. I'm doing you a great yeah. favor. While, really while, good, while committing a, a felony. Person. I'm a good person. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get you a break. $200 off. No, yeah. no. No, I'm, no. I'm feeling a little generous today. <laughs> right, right. With my employer's money. <laughs> Sorry. So, okay. So, yeah. well, it's not even your employer. No. Oh, okay. No. As I, I don't even know who this construction company is. <laughs> and um, so, then about, let's say, 40 to 45 days later of me doing this, um, I'm back in the shop at the the small engine repair shop that I was working at, and my boss comes back, and I'm like sharpening a chain, and he's like, oh, "Matt, there's a detective up front to see you," and I was like, "Oh, fuck!" <laughs> like, and I was like, uh, <laughs> "For me? Yeah." And <laughs> <laughs> no, go back and make sure it's yeah. the right. he's got the right guy. Yeah. And that, and it, so I, when I walk through and I see him, he's in a, in a suit and he's like, he's got his badge on his hip and everything. And he was very cordial. And he goes, hey, I'm here to see you about, uh, you know, he's like, you know, and I was like, you need mm. some gas. That's what I think. I'll meet you down. I'll meet you at the, at the Circle K. Yeah, since, since you're a cop, I'll give you a 50% <laughs> yeah, 50 off. Bucks, yeah, 50%. And uh, so he's like, I'm sure you know. And I, I tried to play stupid. I was like, no. What do you mean? What are you, what are you here for? Golly, it, Chief, yeah. officer. And then he's like, I, I figured you would say that. And then he goes, like, grab his briefcase. Plop. It's like this thick, big, big manila it's, folder. This is at your work. Uh huh. Is your boss there? Or are you in like a back room? No, or? I'm in the front counter. And your boss is sitting there going, Whoa, oh boy, you look like you're in trouble. <laughs> I don't know what you've been up they, to. They were hanging out behind, and I know that they were like, they, I mean, they had to know. Like, I mean. Did you ever fill their tanks up? No. I was going to say, no. as soon as he said gas, they both turn around and bolt. Yeah. Oh. No, they, they didn't know. They were unsuspecting. And so, like the counter, the way it is, like there's the front counter, and then you can go over to the side where it's like a little bit more uh, personal. So <laughs> we go over there, and that's when he plops it out and opens it up, and he's like, "All right, so this is you, obviously." My my face blown up in a picture. Flips it open. He's like, "Here is you getting out of your car, filling up this person. Here is you getting out of your car." inserting the card filling up this person flips it it's just over and over and over and then on the other side he's like so you see all these transactions <laughs> there's there's over uh, like five or six hundred transactions that you have here and every single one of those is a felony and i was like okay um Say, first of all, so, officer, <laughs> officer, you've done amazing work here. Yeah. <laughs> you've done a good job. Yeah, like, and he does look a lot like me. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you find this guy. I, nobody's more upset about this than me. Yeah. Identity theft. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. No shit. <laughs> See, you got to be faster, bro. I know. I know. I just took it. I was like, dude, yeah, you fucking got me. Like, there's, there's no denying it. And so I was like, okay, so what is that? He's like, every time he's swiped, it's a felony. So I, what do you mean? I have, I have 500 felonies against me right now. And he's like, well, I mean, due to the sheer amount that you made within 45 days, which ended up being $21,000. Uh, he's like, I just want to let you know that the FBI is going to be picking this up because this is no longer a state investigation. Oh, okay. I thought this guy was the FBI. No, no just, he was a detective. He was just a detective, and he was letting me know, like, we got you. Pack your and bags. Yeah, we were, we're still doing, like, our um, investigation and everything. I'm not here to arrest you, uh, but I just I want to let you know that the FBI is going to be picking this up. And uh, so I was like, what do you think? How much time do you think I'm looking at? <laughs> like, what? I didn't. I was like, I was fucking just pale. I was a ghost. I keep fucking hitting this thing. God damn it. Sorry. <laughs> And like, I was just, you know, pale, sweating. And uh, after that encounter, he's like, obviously, I'm- say, uh, and you're fucked up on it. Yeah. Can, now I've got to go through detox. Yeah. I got to go to jail. I got to go through detox. I'm already <laughs> fucked up right now. But so, well, so he said, he, I'm not here to arrest you. So he's like, but obviously, you know, I'm going to need that card. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> here you, you go. Yeah. 
you can take that. And uh, he's like, I'm not here to arrest you. We're still doing our investigation. And uh, so you're going to have to go check in with um, a pretrial federal probation officer. So I have to go to the, the federal building. And so I go and meet my, my federal PO. And she's like, so you're on, you're on pretrial. Okay, well, you, so you so you went from I mean immediately went from the this guy just asking you questions. He just told you go downtown. Like you didn't was there a did they give you a they gave you a public defender or anything or a, no? He he said he just that, said show up and he, sign in. He, I think he gave me like a, like a seventy two hours or something to, to train yourself in to check in to check right. in with the with the pretrial because he said that the investigation's still going and we're not going to arrest you yet. <laughs> Like, they are like so nice. Like, they they I need to go to Alaska. Like they came in, they're like nice to you. Like they're like they were. You, you got seventy two hours. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sorry what you're going through, buddy. <laughs> you made some bad decisions. Like yeah. fuck. Yeah, I didn't have never talked to that guy. Never. I mean, I, looking back on it, I mean, it was probably yeah the easiest way to ever get in trouble. Yeah. And uh, so I go and see my my federal PO, and then so we start start pretrial, and obviously I'm still doing drugs, and I'm doing uh, I, at the time probably. Did you have to piss. Yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. not good. Yeah. So she's she's like I'm gonna I'm gonna give you UAs, and I failed <laughs> the first time, of course. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> what, what what does that stand for now? Um, and you so you fail well if you failed like did they well they don't they can't revoke your probation you don't when have you're probation. On you just signed it you didn't you just okay yeah because you know like if you were on probation then, then well, you, you are pre-trial if you've you're on pre-trial then they could lock you up for that right can't they lock you up no they, they won't really lock you up anyway you haven't been charged you haven't been sentenced you haven't been sentenced to anything i don't know yeah you're okay so then why even give you a piss test i, you I know? don't know they were they were trying well, to clean me up before before i went in or something i don't know they were we gonna get you they were trying to give me some rehabilitation right. in some way right but they're gonna get you healthy before they knock your head off exactly yeah. no it's nice it's nice it's the right it's the right thing to do it's, yeah so i fail it and she's like well i'll obviously have opiates in your system um i'm gonna so you gotta Next week, I'm going to try to get you to go to, like, a, an inpatient program or do something because, like, if you keep doing this, we're, we'll, we will put you in. We're, right. we're going to take you in so you're no, lo no longer on pretrial where, while you're in, uh, under investigation. Um, Can I ask you a question? It, what did your parents say? Like, have you told you to tell you go straight home and say, Dad? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I told them. I, I laid it all out because my they knew I was up to something. Yeah. I mean, obviously, like I, I was up to something, and they knew. Like I mean, I'm sitting at dinner and doing the nodding out or watching TV, and I'm so sleepy. I'm working so hard. Yeah, yeah. I've been working twelve hour days, fucking this, yeah. all this gas and stuff. And man, people wearing me out, wanting gas all the time. And uh, so I tell them, I was like, yeah. So, cop came and pretty much caught me, and. Uh, my dad, he was like, yeah, well, I figured you were up to something. So, I mean, what are you going to do? <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't know. What do I do? He's like, well, I mean, you can try to get clean. You need, you need to do something before to try to, to show the judge that you're trying to change and try to make a difference and that you're, uh, you know, that you feel some remorse for what you've done for charging this company, you know, over twenty thousand dollars in forty days, like you put which a, got, which probably ended up having to pay at the most fifty bucks. That uh, once they called their probate, once they called the, once they called the gas company and said, "This is or, all or the credit card company, this is a fraudulent charge. Someone's been caught." Then they they write that off immediately, and the most they can charge them under the um, electronic transfer act is like fifty bucks, and they don't even charge them that, so they have to reimburse them within like twenty four hours. So. You didn't really cost them anything. They did have to make some phone calls, I'm oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Which was agonizing, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. And then, um, oh, so after I, yeah, that was, that was. Your dad, so your dad was saying, sorry. Yeah. He, I mean, he did, he knew I was up to something and my mom is, uh, she, she's, she's very sensitive and she's, she was crying and I know, I know that like I broke her heart and, but my dad, he's, uh. He's not hard to read. He's just uh, a very um, what's what's the word? What is it? 
he's, yeah, he's mellow, very mellow. I've never seen him angry at all. Um, but um, shit, I forgot where I was. <laughs> <laughs> so he was telling your mom was upset and your dad was kind of like look you got to get clean yeah you gotta get your shit straight try and mm-hmm. tell show the judge that you're changing yeah and then so i go through i mean i'm trying i'm trying to stop and i'm getting sick i, I don't have resource there's no resources right in fairbanks we have one rehab that's it like if i came to florida there's rehabs everywhere i mean yeah jesus christ uh, but there's only one in Fairbanks, and the, there was limited bed space. Can't get in there for months. So, so like they expect you to like, I have to keep up my habit for two months until I can get in there. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> like, I like that. Yeah. I like it. That's the that's the drug dealer mentality. So what you're saying is I have to keep my habit. I have to keep this going for two months. Yeah, until you can. And you definitely don't want to go to prison. I mean, you don't want to get pulled into a, the holding cell and detox in the holding no. cell. But inevitably that's what yeah. happened because i could no longer afford oxy in in fairbanks at the time because then they were be, they were becoming so rare that they stopped making them and they transferred they started making the ops and i can't i can't smoke those i right. like i want the instant high i want to smoke them and uh so um heroin comes along way cheaper you, you can get it for 40 yeah. 50 bucks for a for a point uh 0.1 or you can get like a half a gram for a hundred bucks and it's way stronger or i mean sometimes depending on where you got it and it was like the black tar kind and uh so i started to switch to that because it was cheaper and uh the small engine shop still kept me employed thankfully nice uh, i still worked there and then um Towards the the end of, so I got to uh, talk to my, the public defender, uh, federal public defender, and um, she wasn't, uh, she wasn't very nice. <laughs> she, um, she, she just kind of laid it out on me and uh, told me about the point system and everything. And she's like, they'll take your childhood, uh, your, I mean, your petty theft, uh, a DUI, um, uh, like I had a theft for under four dollars. Like that's a point. And then I had a, criminal. It's criminal history. Your, they'll they'll keep every single they'll keep little bumping thing. Up, they'll bump up your criminal history. Yeah. Every single time you've ever been in trouble. So yeah. You could have been arrested once for um, a DUI. You could have been arrested two years later for uh, for you know shoplifting. Mm-hmm. You know, and then and now when you get to sentencing, you're at a criminal history level of three. Right. So it's like. So you're already now you're you're already instead of having like being at like a level six, you're at like a level thirteen, and at a level eight, you're going to prison. Right. So you're already done. Yep. You know, no matter what. Uh-huh. So. So and then after after meeting I'm just, her, I was just clarifying that so that people so, understand. Yeah. 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 So okay. even though all those charges are ridiculously stupid charges, it's, it doesn't matter. Every one of those is going to count for more and more months in prison. Speeding tickets, even. Right. Yeah. Any kind of yeah, it's ridiculous. But, um, so she tells me about that and tells me, I think I had, I I think it was around 16 points or something. Um, and at the time I was on state probation. So I had a SIS, a suspended in position of sentence that was called, I believe for a, a forgery that I did. And so as long as I didn't get in trouble for two years, what was the forgery for? Um, I was like for three hundred dollars or something i mean i was i was withdrawing i was i just found a check and three hundred dollars and i went to the bank that it was and they're like oh yeah hold on just a sec yeah hold on oh, one more second and waiting I, for the sheriff yeah <laughs> waiting for the deputies yeah. oh wait they're here they're yeah, here that's exactly what happened they're like oh, well one, one one more minute and i'm sitting in the drive-thru and then cops come around on both sides and then i mean i was like that i was being an addict, you're willing to fucking do anything yeah, yeah. At, at any oh, cost. Yeah. Like I, I had, I had no regard for any, any, anybody's feelings, or I didn't, I just didn't care. Like I just. Well, and your your risk versus reward is is you know vastly skewed because you're like you're willing to risk anything to get to stay high because you're in such pain. Yeah, I mean, you get to the point where you're you just don't want to be sick. That's right. just, it's just the worst feeling. It's funny too how all the guy how like especially the opiate uh, guys 
to always describe it as being just like being sick. It's it's, like the it's always, worst. You know, it's 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 like their bones ache. Like right. it's a different like com- compared to like other people that go that I've talked to that go through uh, withdrawals. Like it, they always describe it as being like violently like ill. Your whole body's aching. Yes. Your bones hurt. Like, yeah, I was heard. I've always heard that. Like bro, like literally your bones. Yeah. ache. You go. You like alligator roll all night, and like there was a point where I. <clears throat> I had a cell that was right across from the shower. So, like, I'd fucking, I'd be oh, freezing, kind of hot flashes and bones hurting. So, I'd run into the shower and I'd sit in there for 15 seconds and then run across to my cell and so get, under the, get under the blanket so I could just finally sleep for maybe 30 seconds because you can't sleep either. Um, but that, so that's, that's, a, that's the, another. The forgery. So, the forgery, you did the forgery, you're on state probation for that already. Mm hmm. And you're on federal probation, and you're trying to get into a drug rehab. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to, but right. it never happened. No, well, you keep failing the UAs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so They're really it, it, very it, unfair to criminals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I, it just leads up to I think it was another six, maybe not even that long, four or five months later. Um, they get up to like the. The pre-trial and then the the some court dates like there's a there's a court date before your sentencing it's like the um you accept your acceptance of your plea y- yeah you go and you say yeah i'm, I'm guilty yeah guilty plea yeah. Mm-hmm. and so i the guilty plea is actually when they arrested me on the spot but i had a few um court dates before that just like um i fuck I these like a, like an arraignment like arraignment. you were process you there went you in go. you were processed they took your fingerprints yeah. they took a picture of you yeah right that whole thing so you were being arraigned they mm-hmm. let you out immediately on what on a, a or bond like you didn't put up any money right they just no released. okay no yeah i, I was n- never i was never incarcerated until the date of my sentencing, sentencing. yeah and so on that on that day i have right here 221 11s when i was when i was sentenced <laughs> And, uh, I go in there and, um, my, my co-defendant, he, he's already, he's already been sentenced. He, he's never had anything on his record. So he gets probation because I mean, obviously through, uh, when, when I was talking to the investigator, uh, he's like, I just want to know when, when you came into possession of this card. And I was like, whenever you see it spike, yeah. like whenever you see it's being swiped every day, that's, that's me. Right. So, like, they calculated the differences and everything, and and they know it's his card. Yeah, they right. he took yeah. a plea. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, and he, he just got probation. Yeah. yeah, that was it. And uh, so, come to mind, um, I I had written out like a, a little letter just 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 to you know kind of level with him, be like you know, I'm I'm not a fucking awful person. Like I'm not evil. I'm not I'm not trying to do this to try to just you know fuck everybody over like i'm i have a problem i'm i'm an addict like i i have issues to who? I'm, I'm saying this to the courtroom i'm to, saying okay. this to the judge and uh i was just you know letting them know like i i feel remorse for what i did it, it was it's awful it's stupid um i mean i it's just a very immature way of trying to <laughs> deal with my addiction and uh i said i mean if it wasn't for the for the case of me being addicted to drugs this this wouldn't be happening obviously and he actually kind of leveled with me and he's like i have a daughter that's caught up in that stuff right now um and i i feel for you kid um i honestly feel like you need a real bit rehabilitation more than you need a, a prison sentence but due to the sheer amount of money that you made within the 45 days or whatever like you, you got to be sent into something, right? What was what were they already recommending? What was probation recommending? Sixteen to eighteen months. Sixteen, to, sixteen to eighteen months. Yeah. Oh, okay. Jeez. Okay. For yeah. fucking twenty one grand. Yeah. It was because of all my little priors, my little points. I don't know why I'm looking at Connor. He doesn't. He's not going to help. He doesn't understand. No. But he looked at me like he looked at me like I don't. How am I? Supposed, I don't. <laughs> that sounds reasonable. Yeah. Um. But no. Yeah. That that's that's out. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Was, I, I know people have sold a couple hundred thousand dollars and ended up with probation. Mm-hmm. So. So but it was. It was. It, it's all of your. It's all of your. Uh, your criminal history level. Yeah. Okay. That's that's what led up to me. Ha- having to have that much 
And so, and what he said is like, you know, I have to sentence you to something, obviously. So I'm going to give you three months. I was like, three months. Okay. I've never done any, any time at, at the time. Like I've done three days maybe for driving without a license because at that time driving without a license was a, a jailable offense. And, uh, I had a, I think I had a DUI or something and, um, never done any time before. So he sentenced me. Uh, I was doing heroin up to that day. I did, I smoked heroin before I went and got sentenced. And, uh, he told me that. And then my, both my parents there, my mom was crying and like, I kind of broke down. I was like, all right, here I go. And then they handcuffed me and they put me in the little federal holding cell. Kind of broke down, bro. I, I cried like a small child. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. Like you could, yeah, I was unconsolable. Yeah. I, he, I got considerably amount, of, a considerable amount of more time than you, but it doesn't matter if it's a month. No, it's devastating. Yeah. Because you're taking, you, I mean, you're, getting taken away from everything yeah yeah oh, especially for your first time ever like you get taken and away you have to go through detox or yes. you have to, you have I, to go through yeah. withdrawals i have to go withdrawals good times yeah so then from there i they send me to fcc fairbanks correctional center um and uh so, question when they locked you up right there in the courtroom and they lead you away the mm -hmm. marshal leads you away yeah. right mm -hmm. they lead you down the hallway mm -hmm. and then like, they put me in a little gate Right. And they leave me there until like until they're ready to transport. All right. Which the federal building to FCC is three miles away. But I'm in there for like four hours. And just with me and my head and my thoughts and be like, oh, my God, I can't believe I did this. I'm so fucking stupid. I know I'm never going to do this again. Like this fucking I'm, I need to change my life around. I need to do something. And uh, finally, yeah, after three or four hours of me in there, bawling my eyes out and fucking beating myself up and saying how much I like slandered my last name. I like uh, hurt my parents and all this. So many, everything goes oh, through yeah, your head. Yeah. Just the most awful fucking things you can think of. And uh, they come and, come and get me and they handcuff me and put, go to FCC. And then like by that night, I'm like, I'm already tossing and turning. And, and FCC, like there's a lot of people in there that are going through the same shit. There's a lot of people that are going through withdrawals. So like. It's a the, major, major problem in Alaska, right? Isn't it? Like, at that time. Okay. It was the, the Oxycontin epidemic was huge. It, it was really big. Yeah. Back in 2010, 2011, it was, that was the main thing. There was a lot of people doing it. And uh, so I get to FCC and I, of course, I know quite a few people in there because it's a, just a small town. And they're they're like, here, this will help. Here, take some candy and, then, you know, like whatever, anything that'll help. And he's like, make sure you go take a shower, go do this. And like everybody knows that I'm going through withdrawals. So they're like, just leave them alone and let them sleep it off. Because there's probably in. So there's uh, a a wing, B wing and C wing. And a wing is the the higher, higher. um like uh higher security and then b wing is like the, the low level and then c c wing is the workers and b wing is just like it's, it's just it's disgusting like it's like the kind where you just look down and there's like mold and dripping water onto like the cement and uh, all the paints scratched off and it's just it's not very clean right um and so yeah I, i'm kicking for seven seven to 10 days before I, I start kind of coming out of it and coming out of my cell and eat and kind of socialize and talking to a few guys that I know outside of there, but that they're in as well. Um, and then like, I start to understand some of the, cause I've never done time. I know that there's certain politics, certain things you should do like, um, in jail. It, it's not, uh, the polit there's no politics in FCC really right at all yeah there's too mixed up there's not enough there's not enough guys to get together to no. be dangerous it, so it's, it's, it's whites and natives yeah that's it so <clears throat> after 20 20 30 days like I'm I'm playing spades you know I'm playing spades with these guys and I'm eating hanging out I'm like oh, this isn't actually isn't ain't too bad I can do this I can do this for what I'm not, I've been here for 28 days I can do this for 
70 more. This is easy. Maybe they won't even take me to federal pen or federal <laughs> FCI. And then on uh, day 30, uh, they go over the, over the uh, intercom, the lawn, roll it up. And I was like, and everybody's like, oh, shit, federal, here we go. And uh, yeah, I knew. So I rolled it up. I mean, all I have is my blankets and I have my paperwork. So you throw your sheets and your blankets in the bin. And and uh, so they walk me up to booking. So that's it's no longer um, just the correction officers. I walk over and then there's the FBI. So they got their, I always know their FBI because they got their tan pants and their blah, blah. And, um, you mean the U.S. Marshals? Yes. Yeah, the okay. U.S. Marshals. going to say. Yeah. Uh, and so there, I think there was maybe two or three. I think there's three total, including me, that were all federal and we were getting transported. And uh, it's at that time, January, December, February. So it's about February. So it's fucking cold. Uh, at that it's Alaska yeah I'm assuming it was cold the whole time I thought it was cold I, I didn't know it was a warm spot <laughs> there there is for about three or four months and oh, then, nice. yeah yeah other than that it's cold um so they uh, they chain gang us and put us in the van and then we fly up to this little private uh airway and they put us in these little the little bush plane and just a little two propellers and uh so fly and us marshals with you the whole time yeah yeah two marshals um, they were, they were super chill, um, comparatively speaking to the marshals that I encountered later. Um, so then I fly to Anchorage and they, I go to the Anchorage jail and I'm at the, I'm not, no, I, at the time I'm like, where, where am I going? Like, are they just gonna, am I going to Anchorage? Am I going to stay here? Like, I, they don't tell you anything. I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. So, and then they put me in some podunk cell they put me in a tub a little tub like because there's no bed space anymore there's two bunks and then they put you in a, a tub pretty yeah, much yeah. with a mat a boat they, they call them a boat it's yeah. an orange right is it was it orange it was gray it was gray so yeah. it's like a it's like a looks like a almost like a what do you what do you it's call like it? a like shallow a, fucking canoe or something yeah like a like a really shitty low boat that yeah yeah like a um I'm trying to think not a canoe like a kind of like a kayak kind of like a kayak canoe kind of thing yeah yeah, yeah and then yeah. you stick your mat in there yeah. and then i got some guy up front on on the top that's fucking of course annoyingly snores every damn night and then i got the guy on the bottom bunk that's going through withdrawals himself so I'm on the floor and this guy is in full fledged withdrawal, shitting himself and puking. And I, I'm just like, I, I, dude, I need to get the fuck out of here. Like, I, I'm seeing, seeing that in perspective, like he was like, got to be 50 years old and he's still going through what I just went through when right. I was 20 years old. And then it like kind of put it in perspective. I was like, dude, I'm not going to be 50 years old and going through this shit anymore. Right. No way. I do not want to be that dude. And, uh, I was in there for two, two or three days. And were you, the, you were locked in the cell the whole time. 21 hour, 20 yeah. hour lockdown. So we were just out for breakfast, lunch, dinner. That's it. And, uh, in there for for three days and then yeah they bang on bang on the door the lawn roll it up i was like thank fucking god i don't care where i go anymore i don't want to be in here and uh i try asking him i always try asking him like where am i going you know, like we yeah, can't I where i can't tell you yeah. that and um from there there was probably about 10 or 15 uh federal and in, uh inmates that were in anchorage and they, I think on this one, so they do the hip restraints to your handcuffs, your hips, and then your feet, and then they attach you to two other people and then put you on the bus. And then from the bus, then we go to the, another private airport or something and put, it, put us on the plane. And I'm, my public defender said that with the amount of time that you have, you, as far as you're going to go is Seattle, SeaTac. Like there's, there's no other reason why you'd go anywhere else because you're low, you're low level. Like there's, that's as far as you should go. So after I was, I'm on the plane heading to Seattle right. 
And I'm like, okay. there's no federal, you told me earlier, there was no, yeah. there's no federal prison there's in Alaska. No, there's none. Um, so I know that's where I'm going. I'm like, okay, so I can kind of relax. This is, this is my last destination. And uh, so I, I get in there and walk in and it's, it was a whole different kind of feeling because it's, it's not a jail. It's, it's prison. Jail and prisons are like, I didn't, I didn't realize. Yeah. Vastly and, different. Yeah. yeah. So I walk in and this, this like a big two tier. Were you going to say something? I was going <laughs> to say something. This was with a plane. Mm -hmm. right. No, this is all. Oh, yeah, oh, okay, okay. yeah. Sorry. Um, so I, yeah, I walk in and it's a whole different feel because all the whites approached me there. Everybody's like, Hey, do you need anything? I like, I, I, do you need any food? Do you need it? I mean, socks. Do you need any shower just, slides? Yeah, yeah. Do you need a toothbrush? Do you, like, I got I, some soups for you. Do you need keefy coffee? Exactly. What, what do you need, bro? I got a lock for your locker. Give me that back when you go to commissary. Yeah. The whole yep, thing. Yeah. And like this, it, it was so, I never experienced something like that. It was like, I just felt like they were like, hey, we're here. Like, if you need us, yeah, support, let me know. Support yeah. group, definitely. And then, but then I noticed like the other guys that I came with, their their race went up to them and yeah. did the same thing. I was like, oh, that's yeah. that's kind of cool. I mean, and uh, so I go <clears throat> go to my cell and I'm kind of situating myself and I'm, I'm in there with, uh, he, he was just a uh, Mexican. I don't know if he was a North side or South side or anything, but he was really super chill i think he was younger than i was um and he's we have lockers in there and he's got like cans and cans of like sprite and pepsi and all this stuff he's like, you can have some if you want some and or i was like i don't, I don't want to accept anything from anybody that just uh, you've been I, told yeah you've been told don't accept anything yeah because then they want something they want something back from you connor yeah that's how that works it is yeah, remember that time? You know, yeah, that, yeah, you yeah, remember that? You're going to help me out. Now uh, <laughs> now I need you to meet me in the shower. So, whoa, whoa, bro. It was yeah. a fucking 7-Up, man. It was a fucking can of soda. What are you that doesn't That does that's, not add up. That's crazy <laughs> interest. I don't care. That's crazy interest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's so, what I used to say, the difference between being in the medium. When mm -hmm. I, was in the, I was in a medium uh uh, at Coleman, I was at the medium for like three years. Difference between being in the medium uh, prison and being in the low was in the medium. If some guy left a Snickers on your pillow, don't oh, eat it. Oh fuck no! But if they leave it if, at the medium, you can eat it <laughs> because that dude comes to you and says, "Hey man, uh, what you got my man? Fuck you! Yeah, hey fuck it, I ate your fucking Snickers. I might be in your fucking locker later. What what room are you in? Yeah, because yeah. they're not gonna do anything in the medium. No. They're pretty much fucking. They're pretty much set. They're okay. But, yeah." Yeah, but anyway, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't want to. You don't want to take that Pepsi. Yeah. No, I know. I've heard about you, yep. Predator. Yeah, I know what you're trying to do. Set me up, motherfucker. <laughs> um, and then so first night, first night I'm at SeaTac and just getting comfortable. I'm like, finally, I can. This is where I'm going to be laying down. I'm starting to fall asleep and on my door. Lalon, roll it up. I was like, you got to be fucking shitting me. Like, no, no, you got the wrong person. Like, I just are you here. sure? I just got here. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what I said. I just got here. He's like, no. He like, looked at his paperwork. He said, Lalon. I was like, yes, that's my last name. He said, yeah, roll it up. I was like, okay. I mean, so I don't have anything because I just got here. And um, so they put me, I mean, do the, the whole fucking wrist restraints put it to your hips put it around your ankles blah 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 lead us all out to this shittiest fucking plane i've ever seen like i swear there was duct tape holding this thing together yeah yeah they're not it's it's not delta N no 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 it's it, it's it's not even like like what is spirit it's not even spirit like no, and it's just a plain no. gray just there's nothing yeah. on it yeah and, and the stewardesses are fucking horrible no they've got I, shotguns yeah they yell at you the whole time yeah yeah, they're they're they not. They won't nice. let you go to the bathroom. Nope. I don't give a fuck if that lights off or not. <laughs> you're not going. You just piss yourself. Yeah. Because you're probably sitting in a seat. Yeah. That's been pissed in multiple times. Probably. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. They were. I mean, fairly fairly <laughs> nice. Um. So I get. We all get situated. Get on the plane. <clears throat> and we're all sitting there. And then uh, the pilot goes, "Oh, I think we're having a." problem with one of our engines so we're gonna have to you know everybody's gonna have to get off we're gonna have to try to do this again another time that's what you want to hear 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah especially um, yeah, when you're all restrained and getting ready to fly to another another state. Um, like, could you imagine if something happened? Do you ever see that, that one plane? I hate to say this, but do you remember that one plane that I don't know what it was, a DC, whatever. It actually, like, the top of the plane blew off and they lost one of the fucking, one of the stewardesses flew out. Like, if you were chained together with, like, five other guys and one guy goes out, like, you're all going out like yeah. anal beats. Like, you're like, I mean, you're going to be, like, you're, yeah. it's, pop, 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 yeah, pop, even, pop, if, pop. even if one of you could hold on, the other guys are going to be flapping around, hitting the fucking, yeah. hitting the, the fuselage on the outside. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're a pretty strong guy. You'd probably be all right. I'm, I mean, I, I try yeah. my best. So, anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, the plane's not good. <laughs> what imagination you have. <laughs> like, sorry. So, the captain said, listen, there's something leaking out of one of the engines. We don't feel good about this. Yeah. So, anyways, um, so we all fucking, we're all getting off and then go head back to the, uh, to the prison. <laughs> Anal penis. <laughs> That's what I always thought of when I, they would chain me to the guy in front of me. I was always like, we're like a bunch, and we're all in orange. Yeah. Like sometimes you'd be, or you'd have like the the, the paper dresses that they put you in. And yeah. You're like, and I'd be like, uh, there's like there's like twelve orange guy, guys in orange chained together, and I would always, for some reason, I always thought, you know, anal beads. Yeah. I don't know. I'd once seen some anal beads. You know, <laughs> I I well, I knew someone, and and you know they were they were you know, and so I saw you know, and they were they were orange. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Don't don't judge me. I'm not. I mean, okay, I, okay, <clears throat> got that covered. Um, <laughs> it's, we go back in and into the pod, and everybody's like, "Oh shit!" Everybody's back. Blah blah, making fun of us. Like, and uh, then that night, um, the one of the white guys he he uh, approached me. He's like, "Hey, we're making a spread for all the white guys." Like, I've never had any like real food right since being in it was always just like what they gave us and so like in in the in f the federal institution you can you can order a lot of shit you can order i mean at pretty much anything food wise or drink wise and um he made us like not this big plate of nachos with like sliced up sausage and put jalapenos and cheese and yeah what was it Chub. Little chubs, the, yeah, yeah, chubs, the little chubs, and then the squeeze cheese, and all the squeeze cheese, and all that, and and he just he had it for all the white guys. And that night, I was like, man, this is fucking awesome. Like, this is pretty, was pretty cool. Like, it, and uh, then that night again. So this is my second night. Bang, bang on my door again. The lawn roll it up. Four in the morning. Yeah, I was like, okay, yeah, well, I know this time where I'm potentially going. And uh, we all get on there, get situated. There's another problem. There's another problem. Um, yeah, we're all going to have to uh, get on the off. plane. You got on the plane again? Mm -hmm. Like you, you'd figure that they would check the fucking plane before yeah. you get on the prisoners on there. Eh. But yeah, uh, yeah, it goes to show where our, our government money is going. Um, we all fucking get off the plane again. And now and now the pod's like really laughing at us. They're all right. hollering and shit and making fun of us. And I was like, yeah, we're, at, we're back. Here we go. Like, yeah. Yeah, can we get some more nachos? Um, then third night, of course, same thing, repeat. Like I was expecting it. I wasn't even trying to sleep. I was sitting like this, like on my on my bunk, waiting for him. And the uh, lawn roll it up. Same thing. We all get on the plane, and and then pilot doesn't say anything, so we start rolling back. And I'm like, oh fucking, here we go. Uh, finally going somewhere. I'm gonna die. Um, take off. Everything seems pretty kosher, and and then they're uh, then they give you two day old sandwiches and uh, and a little box of juice with your yeah. hip restraints, and <laughs> yeah, they want you to eat them with like this, like <laughs> you're, you have to scoot up the chains hard just enough so you can reach down. It's it's comical watching. If you drop something, it's just gone. It's it's comical <laughs> it's just... watching like like the hardest dudes, like tattoos everywhere, yeah. buff and like they're just struggling to try to eat their little sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> it's just I saw a few guys are like, fuck that, I'm not even gonna try. Yeah. Um and then we land I don't know where we where we landed until uh until I got off the plane because I was like this is, I mean, I'm in Vegas. I can see the Chris Angel fucking pyramid. I can see the strip. I was like, this is cool. I'm getting all my vacation spots checked yeah. off around this because later I found out that they're moving me because of limited bed space, whatever the fuck that means. But that's why they were moving me around. And <clears throat> so they put you on a bus again. 
and I, we're driving through I, I drive through the strip like i'm on a bus just like oh this is fucking cool i'm looking at everything i've never been to vegas and <laughs> You still really haven't been there. <laughs> yeah. I need the, to, yeah. Being in the prison, prison transport yeah. on the way to prison, driving down the strip, it's yeah. not really being to Vegas. Yeah. But. I mean, I was in the location <laughs> yeah. of, so, I mean, I didn't get to experience, of course, real Vegas. Um, and then we try, we drive past it and we start going through like this desert, like where there's absolutely nothing. And uh, we pull into the, like, it just it looked like a like an army base because you can't you can't see the fence like it's all the the ground is above the fence and everything so you have to go around through where the gates are until you actually can see the prison and then it's a uh, it was a um a privately owned federal institution called it was just Pahrump, FC FCI and never never heard of the place it's so i guess it's a it's a holding or a transport like facility i guess i have no idea why they sent me there but that's where Do i you know who up. who owned that facility was it like cca or? i i have no idea i because there's I a know. bunch of private there's a bunch of private companies that mm-hmm. like there's cca there's is it global and they where they they build private prisons and they they house uh, federal and state inmates yeah yeah, I I just it, I was obviously brand new because I mean paint was all everything was brand new, and uh, they they put us all in the the little pod, little holding cell, and they're doing their little classifications and stuff, and uh, <clears throat> finally get out of my cuffs, and I think I I'm wearing my so in SeaTac they give you brown, you're wearing your brown and brown. And I'm wearing my shower shoes. That's all I got. And uh, and there, it's the yellow jumpsuit. So you got to go through. I gotta. You gotta change out from your from my SeaTac clothes. You got to go through your whole inspection and do. You know, I'm sure you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's real fun. Yeah, yeah. The bend over, squat, and cough. Yeah, yeah. Lift up um, your sack. Let yeah. Me, let me see yeah. what you got in there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's fun. Uh, and then they, they give you your, your yellow jumpsuits and then I, I turned the corner and I just, it was just huge. Like I could, I couldn't see the end of it. It was just one big long hall and, um, they assigned me to a pod. So, and I walk in and it's just, it's literally, it's, you don't have a cell. There's no cell. It's just, it was like probably a open bay. Yeah, it was like probably it's like a, a sixty room, by right. sixty. Yeah, just yeah. with lines of beds, and then one big TV up here, and then you have one, two, three, four, five tables. So there's all your beds and all, all the little shitters with the um, with the divider that's probably this high, so you can look to the guy next to you taking a shit and say hi. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Or masturbating. Yeah, that's he's, yeah. He's masturbating. Sometimes they'll bring in some uh, some lotion. Yeah, they'll yeah. Be, you know. Yeah, you, you make sure you keep your blinders on. Yeah. Whatever you're you know. doing, you don't want to look over ever. <clears throat> or sometimes maybe you do. Maybe you say, <laughs> you, "Tom, you, what are you, you looking at there? Come on, stop it, Cox. You know what I'm doing. What are you doing? <laughs> What's all that noise? <laughs> you eat macaroni? Yeah. What's going on, bro? Oh, so. <laughs> Worry about your damn self. <laughs> And uh, can I read that later? <laughs> is that is that the one with uh, what's her name in it? Yeah, God damn it, Cox. <laughs> so we're I go into this one and uh, I'm not approached like by the white guys this time. Like this is this is just a big fucking dorm, and uh, so I find out this is where I'm at and where my bed is, and I'm in fucking Nevada. I'm like, what am I? I'm like thinking, I'm like, how much time do I have left? Like I've been, this is I was okay. gonna say, yeah. half your sentence has been to transport. Yeah. I mean. Like I'm at this point, I was like, I think I have probably 50 days left. Should like, you be putting me in for halfway house? No, yeah. And uh, so I find my bunk and then eventually to like talk to, so, I mean, he was white because obviously he was a skinhead, had a bunch of tattoos and blah, blah, blah. And he, this place was super politicky. Like he, he was, he let me know, this is where I, I learned where there's the, the Norteños and the Sereños. He's like, okay, so you can associate with the Southsiders and you can tell that they're Southsiders because they have a shaved head. The Northsiders don't. 
but some of them do. I was like, how the hell? Is there a manual? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I was like, how do you expect me to? I was like, you know, I'm. How about I just don't associate with any of them? <laughs> then I'll be okay. And then he's like, um, and there's uh, there's this one guy. He's mixed. He's he's he has a a white mom and a black dad, so he has he's mixed. So he he runs with us. So I yeah, just want to let you know that like that's that's what we're doing around here because the pod. I think there's ten. 11 white dudes the rest of them were north side or south siders or or blacks and uh well, how many people are in the unit total probably 40 or 50 i want to say this is 40 for this 10 if 10 of them are that's like 25 percent white guys yeah huh. <laughs> yeah and so what's so funny is in prison like having this conversation like you can't have this conversation in the real world because no. in the real world, like it, it's funny, you go to prison and it like the black guys can be right next door, right next to you. And say, listen, let me tell you about the black guy. Don't talk to let me, I fucking see. And they're right there. You, you're like, you know, you just get off the street. You're like, bro, bro, what's your, there's a black guy right <laughs> there. Like, what are you saying, bro? Yeah. And then, you know, and it's like such a, a an issue and, in prison and then you get out and, and you still have it's that the, mentality but it's the exact opposite yeah but it's yeah. the exact you know it's it's it, and it was so funny to people out here like they're like you know you know racism and prejudice they're like this is not racism no you have no <laughs> idea no idea what racism no is idea. but so he gives me that little bit of a lowdown and then one one morning we get uh um it's like waffles or pancakes and little apple slices for for breakfast and they give you like a little spoonful of, of peanut butter and the the white slash black guy the mixed guy that, that ran with us he, he was allergic to, to peanut butter or to get nut allergy or something and he's like here you want mine I, like i can't have it i was like yeah sure i'll take it and put it on my waffle or my pancake ate it and then like a couple hours later the that white dude that first talked to me about the politics and everything in there he goes so i saw you took uh some peanut butter from what's his name earlier uh you know that i should beat your ass for that how, like, how big is this guy by the way because basically did you tell him you're like a tourist like I, I'm, I'm 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 on vacation this is this is a couple of months for me bro this isn't yeah. my fucking life he yeah he knew that i was like this is my first time obviously well and it's your your short time right you yeah you let him know like i'm I'm, I'm on. on I'm, I'm on my way out. I've been on my way out since, since I got I, in, right. <laughs> and uh, and that's what he was like. That's what he said. He was like, "So, but since I know you're new here, and I know that you don't got much time, that uh, I'm gonna let this one slide." I was like, "Oh, thanks, buddy. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Like, I mean, he wasn't at at the time. I mean, in 2010, 2011. I mean, uh, I was a a lot smaller i mean he wasn't i was gonna say you're you're a pretty big guy like i was thinking like how big is this guy yeah i mean that that time he was a lot bigger than me right yeah like i i think after i after the withdrawals and everything i started eating i was maybe 140 150 pounds oh shit yeah and I, like well, i yeah. can't imagine you at a buck fucking 40 like yeah i was i mean i was strung you're out you're probably what's 170 now 180 no i'm pushing almost 200 oh fuck <laughs> I think last yeah, I was like 193. Yeah. Well, it would have been a different conversation. Yeah, <laughs> at 200, he, it was at 140. Yeah, if you said that, I, I would have fucking much lifted more, him up by his neck and threw him away. I'm much more polite to people that are 200 pounds. It, yeah, <laughs> no shit. And then, so yeah, that happened, and I was like, okay, well, all right, I thanks, thank you, I understand, sir. Uh, and uh, and then I was there. I was at Pahrump for maybe a week or two and they had uh you could go outside whenever you wanted but it was just like a fenced in area so the, there was the pod and then you could just walk out to maybe a 15 by 15 uh obviously gated it just you could just go out there and chill like there wasn't enough to play handball or anything it was just a, just to go outside and me being from alaska like i didn't get that much sun so i just go i just go and sit like kind of in the corner and just sit there and so soak up the sun and all the guys like hey look at alaska He's just i'm like yeah leave me alone just, i'm just fucking soaking up sun i don't have anything else to do i'm out of here like i, I what 
And then, um, yeah, about a week later, um, over the PA, again, Lalonde, roll it up. I was like, where the fuck else could I possibly going now? Like, I, I'm, I'm pushing under 40 days now. Like, I've been to two, well, if you count the Three. from FCC to Anchorage, from Anchorage to SeaTac to SeaTac to Pahrump, I mean, I've been to yeah. four, four different four. places yeah. already. And uh, I roll it up. I'm like, okay, uh, where the fuck am I going to go now? Um, and then I think this time, let's see, I was in Vegas. So I... We took a bus this time. I, they didn't fly me. We took a bus all the way from Prum, uh, Nevada. And then I ended up arriving to Sheridan, Oregon, FCI. And uh, that's where I did the remainder of my time. And in, in FCI or, or in, the, in Sheridan, um, it was three-man cells. And you have to go there first. You have to go into the classification pod. And at that time, I think I had 35 days left or something. So they didn't, they couldn't classify me to put me into where I was supposed to go. Right. Because most guys stay in classification in that pod for a week. And in, in that classification pod, you're on 21 hour lockdown. Same thing. Lunch. I mean, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And uh, three man cells. And, um, first couple nights, uh, they, they were, they were pulling people out and be like, okay, you're going here and then you're going here. And then I'd get a cell to myself and be like, oh, this is nice. And then until more came in. And then, uh, so in, in, in Sheridan, they give you, of course, when you get there, I'm in another yellow jumpsuit, but they also give you a, a, a jacket with a hood because in that particular um pod or that that uh federal detention center it's it was it was just cold in there and i mean they give you jackets and because you can go outside too and it has a, a hood on there and there was one morning right there uh, there they pop the doors and it's, it's breakfast time and I have my jacket on everybody's wearing their jackets like and a lot of them put their hood on because and that doesn't fucking matter, but I'm sitting in line, like shuffling, you know, waiting to get my breakfast and I'm shuffling. And then I hear, um, a CEO say, Hey, take off your fucking hood. And I was like, I know there's plenty of other people wearing their hood. So I, I didn't pay any attention to it and kept going. Hey, do you fucking hear me? Take off your goddamn hood. And I kind of like look back. And I look. I was like, I know he's not fucking talking to me that way. Like I, uh, <laughs> yeah, he is. I know, I, and that, <laughs> he was. And I was like, I didn't. I'm. I'm not gonna. I don't care. I'm at the point. Where I was like, I, you can't. You can't talk to me that way. I just. No matter who, who you are. Like I've just. That's just how I felt. Like I just. It just. It got got me. I was like, don't you, just you motherfucker. And uh, so he came up and grabbed me on the shoulder and I said did you hear me he said take off your fucking hood and I said I don't give a fuck who you are you're not going to talk to me that way just say hey can you can you take off your hood like why do you give us a jacket with a hood if you don't want us to wear the fucking hood and uh he um he said do you know you know who was asking you to do that to take off your hood you know who was asking you to do that that's the warden and I was like okay I, what does that mean he's like well you're disrespecting the warden and the warden told you to take off the hood and that's insubordination and i was like i shut the fuck like i don't care as the warden was he was like a five foot two little mexican dude and he's yelling at me to take off my hood he's like all right well take him to the hole so <laughs> i get sent to the hole for wearing my hood on a jacket that they give you for no fucking reason so i get sent to the hole and uh I get, it's, I mean, the whole is, that's a whole different place. There's, I mean, there's people fucking screaming. I mean, there's yeah, it's people, loud. It, it's very loud. And then I learned that, I mean, after being in there, like for the first day, you, you only get to shower three times a week when you're in the hole and they bring it to you. <laughs> they, they bring the shower to you while you're in the hole. Okay. 
And, well, I mean, I, I've heard of those. That's the, every 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 institution's different, but yeah. yeah. And, so it's on like wheels, right? Like yeah. they wheel it to you. Yeah. And um, you only get three showers a week. I mean, obviously you're on in the hole. You're not allowed to do anything. And I w- I went in there with some dude that I was by myself for the first couple of days. Then they moved me again. And then I get into this cell that's withdrawing from coffee. <laughs> withdrawing from yeah coffee from caffeine. Yeah, because he's. Uh, I mean, he he said he would drink those those little instant packs that you get, little blue ones. I think he said he was going through like three of those a day. And uh, he's just laying in bed with the migraines and shitting himself all the time on the toilet. And like, it was uh, <laughs> it was horrible during that. I mean, but when he was sleeping, like I, I had time to, it was actually kind of peaceful mm-hmm. in, in a weird way. And being so secluded, it's, it's weird what your, what your mind can adapt to so easily. Like <laughs> you understand, I've done your entire sentence in the shoe. Yeah, and really. <laughs> I, did four, I did forty-five days one time. I, I mean, I know guys have done six months. Oh year, yeah, you know. Yeah, but it, it's but it's insane that how what your mind can just it just makes it okay. Yeah, yeah. No, you can adapt to any. I mean, pretty much anything. Yeah, yeah. and it's. I felt I felt comfort and, and solace and and being. <laughs> alone all the time yeah like i was like oh this is nice uh, and then i started writing i started doing like just just writing my my life story and like what i've been through and like i i started having like you know i did maybe i should you know make um an audio autobiography or something or right write a memoir a memoir right. yeah um because to me i mean it's to me it's a big story to other people i mean it's 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 small, but like to me, it's I went through a lot of shit, and uh, after I got, I was on only in the hole for a week. Um, I got back to my to the the um, classification one, and uh, there was this this older dude that I like. I talked to him here and there, and like I liked to listen to the radio course and uh he's like i got an extra radio if you want to use it because i know you're only going to be here for what he's like two more weeks he's like you can, you can keep it and i ended up having a cell to myself for the remaining three weeks i think that i had there and uh they started the the breakfast lunch and dinner hour and then between those those three hours they would let you out for a half hour so you got i was on 20 hour lockdown instead of 21 and i was walking i I was just walking around on the tier and then i had this this uh (laughs) this i think he might have been a north sider i'm not sure but he had like a big big tattoo of like you know like like the georgia bulldog or whatever he had on his chest and he was animal lover yeah yeah and uh he just he loved to talk and then, I mean, I like to listen. So he just we just walk around. And he'd bullshit, and we talk, and then blah blah blah. And then the old dude, he he was doing my laundry for me. Like he was just because he was a worker in that uh, facility, so he was allowed to be out the whole right. time. Um, yeah, a lot of guys will do that just to be able to be out of the cell. Like yeah. it's, it's it it. it, it your time goes so much faster if you're working and if you're just laying in, in your fucking yeah. bunk the whole time. Yeah. And I, of course, was, I hated reading before I went in. And then I ended up reading, you know, a bunch of books while I was in there. And and then I would listen to the radio and I had this, the, the window was probably about this big, probably about three feet tall. And I'd sit, just sit out there and listen to my music and you can see who's coming in from for where, where I was. You could see all the new arrivals and everything and then um towards the <clears throat> I think it was my second to the last day uh the the guy that I was walking around with that I would talk to all the time with the big, the big tattoo I mean he was he was pretty pretty big um scary looking dude but he was he was funny like uh he's like hey you got a new celly I was like, oh, fuck. I was like, come on. I, I almost had it. I almost had my cell to myself the rest of the time. And uh, I walk in there, and it's this this pudgy little just white dude, never 
been and never been in trouble in his life. He got, he got uh got caught for embezzlement because he worked at a bank, and he got like forty eight months or something. First time, never seen jail. He was petrified. <laughs> He was so fucking scared. I walked in there. He was like, "Hey, um, is it okay if like if I put my stuff here? Because it's a three man cell. There's two bunks right here, and then there's a there's a single bed. And of course, I went on the bottom bunk. I was like, you can you can sleep on that one. I don't care. You can take the top. I don't give a shit. And no one had a blast with that guy. So I what I did no. I'd have been like, I'd have been like so have they raped you yet? <laughs> So the dude that I that what I was walking around with, he's like, "You want me to fuck with him?" And I was like, "Dude, oh yeah, okay, let's see, let's go ahead." So he walks in there, opens the door. He's like, "Hey man, you owe me my fucking money. You got my fucking money. I know you fucking stole my money." And he's like backing up and fall. He's like, "No, I swear, I swear, I didn't do it." And he's like, "I'm just fucking with you, man." And I was, and then I grabbed it, grabbed that dude. I was like, "All right, that's enough. He's gonna fucking shit himself." And uh, I was like, "So." This is my, uh, I'm getting out tomorrow. I'm going to give you all, all the, you know, the rules and regulations of what you should, should and shouldn't do. And he's like all night till like 12, one. He's like, well, what if I, what do I do this? Or who do I talk to? Or where can I sit? Or like, I was like, just keep to your own, man. Like just, you, you don't want to get in a car. You don't want to fucking do any of that shit. Like you don't want, you don't want to get involved. I can tell by the way you look and what you're doing i i, I don't think you're the you softest god yeah yeah and it's uh not hard like me baby <laughs> see not <laughs> running that fucking place oh man so and then um that morning uh they're getting ready for release so they, I think it was like eight o'clock. Um, and it was like a female CEO and she was like, so she's like, oh, Matthew, are you, you ready to go? And I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, let's get the hell out of here. And uh, they get me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she, you're damn right I'm ready to go, boo. <laughs> Say no more. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and uh, so they give you, I didn't have any clothes. So, of course, you get your gray sweatpants, your white tee, and your fake uh, fake chucks. And I think I got 120 bucks that the, that they gave me. They gave you $120? Yeah. Motherfuckers. They got to fly me back to Alaska from Oregon. What? Huh? They, but you said they gave you money, though. Yeah, they gave, Yeah, they, it was their fair, f uh, not farewell, but it's like um, was anybody it, put, it's gate money. Gate money? No gate money. I didn't get any gate money. I was only like I'm 13 years. I didn't get gate money. Oh, I got a good luck to you, bro. <laughs> that sucks for you, then. I mean, <laughs> my God, was anybody putting money on your books when you were locked up? Like uh, were your parents putting money on your books or no, not so much. I mean, they did sometimes. Uh, but they, they, uh, my mom, of course, wanted to talk to me and I, I couldn't because she just, she would break down every time. She's just, I just want you to do better. I hope you can make it. And my dad just, he's he, fine. He, yeah. <laughs> just fucking let the kid do his time. He'll get out and figure it out. Um, and then, uh, so I get out, I'm walking out and I can hear everybody banging on the windows and, because they can see me walking out and I go to this to the van and he's wearing like prisoner uh, or oranges. And I was like, are you, you're my driver? He's like, yeah, cause it's a camp. Yeah. So like, I, I just, I had no idea that they would let a prisoner drive me 30 miles away to the airport. They put Jess on a bus and let her drive her or go to the other, like they gave her a fucking voucher, her and a bunch of girls. They got to go hang out for a couple of days and showed up at the prison when they wanted to. Not really. I mean, they had, they had a time today to be there. But they hung out. They went on a bus. They Where'd you stop? Atlanta? Atlanta, uh, Tennessee. We stopped in Nashville. No, they, they caught a show? No, they didn't catch, I'm just joking about the show, but still. Went to a couple bars. Ridiculous. And, yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, I just I did not have any idea that they would have. You fuckers it, had a different experience than I had. There was no gate money for me. Yeah, nobody nobody gave me a, a bus ticket. You I would got, love to ride the bus. You got fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> and then uh, at, before before I went in, I was a smoker, so I was like, he's like, oh, do you want me to stop anywhere? I was like, yes, <laughs> let's go get some fucking cigarettes. And I bought a po- pack of cigarettes, bought a lighter, took one drag. And fucking coughed my ass off and i was like okay well i'm over uh, that oh oh, yeah i don't fucking want to smoke cigarettes if i'm not fucked up on opiates so that's that's gone and then i get to the airport and they had like a they have like a nike shop in there and i was wearing my white tee and they gave me the money and i was like i want to get a black nike sweatshirt so i don't look like i just fucking got out of prison and (laughs) and then i got some burger king and then got on my flight yeah <clears throat> and i got on my flight and they told me of course you need to report to your federal probation officer within 24 48 hours or something and uh i report and they as soon as i get there the my federal po that she was assigned to um when she saw me because she, she saw my federal uh my inmate card and like i had my head shaved and she's like i was Honestly, I was really worried about you in there because your picture looks really bad. <laughs> like, you look like you were having a very hard time. I was like, I mean, I, I was, but I mean, not really. She's like, so are you doing okay? I was like, yeah. Oh, fuck. What a, who'd they give you for a PO? My PO fucking was constantly going to throw me back in fucking prison. She the, needed my guts. They were the, I mean, probably the nicest POs that I've ever What's dealt happening? with. You could just go to Alaska, you guys. <laughs> oh my God. And then yeah, I report to her. And uh, she says, well, of course, you need to get a job and you do this, blah, blah, blah. Check in once a month. And I did. I had five years. Five years of federal probation. Did not fuck up once. Did did absolutely, like, t- the last year, she's like, or last almost two years, she's like, you can check in every... Uh, every four months i think she's like you can check in every four months yeah and you don't even have to come in just call just call and check in because i was i was passing all my piss tests i was working i was doing everything right passed all my piss tests yeah. i had to take a, a year worth of 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 criminal behavior modification classes with a with a psychiatrist once a week for an hour and while i was every twice a month being piss tested i didn't even have a drug charge jeez god they man I'm still on federal probation. It's been yeah. three years. I just got denied. I tried to get off uh, early. Yeah. Know, they said no. I don't. They're holding a grudge. It's <laughs> resentment, is what it is. It's they're they're still they're irritated. They're up. I'm sure. six million. But yeah. it's you know they're holding it against me. But anyway, I could see why. You had a vastly different experience. But yeah. Ahead. So, well, okay. <laughs> got a PO this like giving you like hugs and say you're okay. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. I, they, I, there was only two of them and they were both female. So it was like, uh, it was, <laughs> yeah. It was, it was blonde hair, blue eyes. Didn't, you know, that, that, that probably went a long way with them. I'm sure. Yeah, it did. They, uh, she was, she was pretty attractive too. Anyway, hope she doesn't see this. Um, uh, so I did that. I finished it without a hiccup and that was five years. And then, I lasted about one year off being probation. So at that time, you lasted one year. I lasted. What? So what does that hold mean? Hold on, hold on. I lasted one year after being off probation without fucking up again. So fucking up mean like uh, I relapsed. Uh, relapsing. Okay. Yep. So I relapsed, and uh, during those five years, I. I was working at a very, very good business. Uh, I had a truck, a car, a place. Like I had two, like two vehicles at my own place, and I was doing very, very well for myself. Like I, I felt like I was like I, I did it. I like I told myself when I was walking out of, out of Sheridan, like I'm never gonna touch that shit ever again because it ruined my fucking life. Like I have this, this stain on my record now. And it's going to haunt me forever. And I was like, I'm going to do everything within my power to try to turn my life around. And 
I did it for five years and I thought like, I thought I had it licked. I thought like, you know, I, I did it. Like right. I, I came out and uh, that's, that's the funny thing about addicts is like, I mean, it, you, one change of thought, like, and you're, you're done. And so at that time, uh, like, like I said, I think it was like six years. I, I had my own place and I, I woke up one morning and I had, um, the, my closet closeted mirrors and next to my bed. And I, like, I swung my legs over and I, I just, I just have this distinct memory of like, I looked at myself and I just said, I'm not happy. Like, uh, I have everything that I could possibly want materially, but I don't have, I, I feel unfulfilled. There's, there's a hole somewhere. And I just, I just said, fuck it. Literally, I said, fuck it. And I was like, I'm on a mission to go find whatever I can find and get high because I, I'm not happy. I just, I want to feel happy. I, I, there's something missing. And that within that day, of course, I found, I found heroin. And within the first week, um, I, I found the needle. And then I started become, becoming an intravenous heroin user. And then within the second week, I figured out I can mix meth and heroin in the same syringe and then put that in my vein. Holy that's, fucking shit. That was, uh, that's the best feeling I've ever had. And uh, within probably, I would say, a month and a half to two months of me shooting meth and heroin into every vein that i had in my body i had i had no money ag again i fucking my car went to shit my truck went to shit i w it came to the point where i was having to steal steal shit and then no gas card no more gas card so i had to figure out some other way um so i would go to like empty like construction sites and steal all their tools and then pawn them off and do or trade them for for heroin or meth or whatever and uh i had <laughs> i had there was a construction site where we took a bunch of stuff and then there was this this it was like a heater that like when when, when it's under construction in alaska they have these big huge heaters that you can put it under under the like uh, under a tarp and it'll heat the entire place and uh we di I, we didn't have a place to put it and it was me and two other people and uh we just i put it on the top of his truck with no 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 straps no nothing and i just went down this we went down the street and hopefully it didn't roll off and we put all the tools and everything inside my house and uh i brought a bunch of stuff to one of my dealers i got like three grams three or four grams of heroin and a couple grams of meth for just these tools the guys running a pawn shop pretty much yeah, yeah. and then some of them i took the, to the pawn shop as well under my name like I, I just didn't give a shit anymore like i i don't like i'm gonna get caught eventually so fuck it like let's just do it let's get it over with that's that was my mindset like and and uh within yeah like i said after about two months um i had three or four cops banging on my door with a warrant and they i opened it like i was still i was like halfway out of it i woke up on my couch like with i think like a needle still stuck in my fucking arm and uh opened the door and they like grabbed my arm, took me out and put them in the car and started searching my house and found all the tools and all this other shit and um, booked me back into FCC and then they charged me with the uh, mix four, which is like in possession of drugs, um, a burglary two and then a theft two. Um, so I ended up pleading out to the, the theft two and so that's going to be that would be my second felony uh i was looking at is this state though this is state now yeah and um 
I think that she told me I was looking at three years. I was like, I did, I made $21,000 and I went to the feds and they gave me three months and I took $3,000 worth of construction, uh, construction stuff. And I'm looking at potentially three years. And, uh, so what they did is they did, uh, Two years, one suspended, and then four years probation. I did, so the state prison in Alaska is Goose Creek. And um, that's uh, state and federal prisons. I mean, they're vastly different. Yeah. Vastly. And then, so in Alaska, we, you don't have you don't have a bunch of Mexicans or anything running around. There's It's, it's a lot of whites, blacks, and natives, and that's it. And uh, in in Goose Creek, you, you're allowed to wear whatever you want as long as you have one article of yellow clothing. Like if you you can wear your jeans, you can wear the shoes that you came with. You can order your shoes off East Bay or whatever. You can get you can get all kinds of shit. You a yellow T-shirt. Yep. Or you just put on a yellow hat. Anything. Um, but then I mean, if you get nice shoes, you're gonna get jumped for your shoes. Like I see, I seen guys getting fucking jumped for their shoes all the time. It's ridiculous. I won't wear nice shoes. Then. No, and I didn't. <laughs> and well, not for long. <laughs> and no. And so while I was in that prison, so there's, if there is like one long stretch right here, and then this is in the middle. That's the yard, and then right here is like A, B, C, D, E, F pods. And come like uh, breakfast time when they announce it, you have to go from your pod across the across the yard at six six o'clock in the morning at thirty below, and every like you have to sprint to go to go get your breakfast. Like it's it's horrible. Um, How much time did you get though? Three years. They did two years, oh, one two, su- year. two years, one suspended. So, and then with good time, you do eight months. Okay, I didn't understand that. Yeah. Okay. So I I was there for for eight months, and then still, I mean, that was that eight months isn't that's not that long. You get into your routine. You start going to the gym. They had a track, and then like you, I had a little a couple friends that I hung out with. I mean, it was all the time that I did. It was easy. I mean. <laughs> I, I learned in state, like, okay, so in, 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 in Goose Creek, you have a card for your door. Like, it's only your card that opens your door. So you have, you have your own cell. Mm-hmm. Well, you have one celly, but you, both of you only have the, the, the lock or the, the card that unlocks your door. Right. Um, like a hotel room. Pretty much. Uh, and then you learn, because you have uh, a glass window that's probably about five by five. That, that you can see into your cell. And I learned very quickly, you don't want to look into people's cells because you don't want to see shit that you don't want to see. Right. And uh, yeah, I learned that real quick. Um, and then, so I ended up getting a celly that, that had a TV and that he worked all the time. He and had a TV? Yeah, he had a TV. In prison? Yes. <sighs> Dude, I'm telling you, you guys need to go to Alaska. I, like, what I the don't. Hell? <laughs> <clears throat> wow. Yeah, he had a blue jeans, tennis shoes, and TVs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Okay, but and it's then, cold. It, it's cold. Yeah, I I'm not. I don't. I'm not good with the cold. Bro. No, no. I mean either, but I'm not. I'm good not with good the with heat. the heat either, bro. It's no. just as miserable with here. No, I, I fu- I was trying to change my tire, and I was like, I was dripping in sweat, and then Hannah, she was like, you need to stop. Like, <laughs> I'll take over from here because it looks like you're about to die. Jess works in outside all day. I don't know what she's thinking. No, the first job that I took here was landscaping. Oh, that's ridiculous. And I got heat stroke twice the first week I was here. <laughs> I don't like walking from the front door to my car. Dude, there's, I mean, if you walk outside in Alaska and it's 40 below and you walk out, your face 40. just freezes. It just... Forty below. It's I a, can't even imagine. It takes your breath away, like and your what face. Forty away. What forty below is? I don't. I, I've never experienced anything like that. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I wouldn't do it. 
but like it's yeah uh, you walk out and you're like your face freezes and then if you're out there for too long like your your lips will start to like <laughs> it's just it's so weird because your your lips will get stuck and then it gets harder to talk and it's yeah it's not fun but then comparatively to walking out here and now like i'm instantly sweating yeah it sucks anyways state um, prison state prison um your key uh he uh he worked a lot he i think he was in the kitchen so he'd go for for two hours at breakfast two hours at lunch two hours at dinner and so i'd sit there and i'd watch um ridiculousness I'd, I'd sit there and watch the reruns of ridiculousness every single day and then i would go they had a gym um it, they didn't have any free weights so it was all cables and pull-up bars and dip bars and <laughs> there's no fucking <laughs> nautilus equipment in federal prison there's no free weights there's nothing none of that stuff no there's no there's no but i mean in federal there's no no like equipment no You were yeah, at camp. I, yeah, you at camps. Camp. At camps because yeah, I saw I saw the the entire like layout of the gym when I was coming into into Sheridan on the bus, and I, I saw it. There was like free weights, a bench, everything. So unfair. You you're 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 burglarizing places. She's running a, a, a fucking meth ring. I, I filled out some paperwork. I, I I was in there with guys. I was in there with serial killers and shit. I'm, I used to have I used I used to have uh, I used to have lunch with a guy that killed like eleven people. Yeah, I mean, I mean but I'm sure he was a really nice guy. He was. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, he was nice to me. <laughs> yeah, he was old now. He's pretty much feeble and and not able to kill me. But I'm sure he would. If there were times he wanted to kill me, I saw yeah. it in his face. <laughs> yeah, you could tell. So yeah. Anyway, I, okay, yeah, sorry. I met I met a lot of really nice murderers. No, yeah, no. I mean, well, they and they have a low recidivism rate too. <laughs> One of the lowest, like like they almost get out, almost almost never do it again. Yeah, I mean almost. I uh, sometimes depends on yeah, but the, the uh, yeah, like I said, um, watch TV, go to the gym. I would uh, at the last month, I would say that I was there. Um, I got, they pulled me over to, it's like the, uh, the booking, booking side and they had me sign paperwork. They were going to send me to a halfway house in Anchorage. And, uh, I go to the halfway house in Anchorage and I end up getting on the utility maintenance crew. So uh -huh. the maintenance crew has the top level of the, um, the halfway house, which is like the pent suite, the penthouse suite, because... <laughs> It has a big screen TV, it has a couch, and then, and then you have three different rooms and you get your own room. And uh, the guy... I had nine guys in the house. I was the only white guy with, with, with eight black guys. I was the only white guy in the halfway house, in, in my room. There were nine people in a room. I bet that was uncomfortable. It, wa it, was, it was uncomfortable. I used to, listen, I, and the cops, when they would come around to count, they would be like, Cox, you okay? You okay? I'd be like, <laughs> We need some. We need some uh, diversity in here. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And you know, but yeah. there's never any diversity. It's kind of dark in here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um. Then, uh, so I go to the halfway house, and and then I realize that uh, they have a lot of suboxone in there, and I'm. Oh, you've got a problem, dude. Yeah, you think? <laughs> and oh my God. And so they. And then I found a guy that had meth, and they have suboxone. And I have two or three weeks left at this halfway house, and they call me down for a UA. Those fuckers. Uh, yeah. Why would they do that? Yeah. Don't they know? God. I just... <laughs> that I, just, I have a problem? I, wasn't, I just didn't... I, I accepted the fact that I was going to be just like this career, like, cr criminal, just oh, just a repeat offender. That's That's what I accepted my life as being. Like, I'm just... You know, I have no worth anymore. I have, I have, I have no oomph no no desire to i just i feel like i fucked everything up i how old were you uh, during state when the halfway house when i was in the halfway house i was so this was in 2016 17 18 uh so i was 27 oh yeah 27 it's too late to turn your life around at 7 27 you might as well just kill yourself yeah what is going on <laughs> anyway jesus 
I mean, try starting over at 50. I, it, I spit on it. Yeah, you almost, almost got Jesus. me. Um, I, yeah, I, that's, I mean, it, it just, you get a, uh, a feeling of being just so defeated. <laughs> just, <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, go ahead. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> You're 27. Yeah. He's like 27, five foot ten, blonde hair, blue eyes, good looking. I mean, oh my god, my obviously, life is over. Go obviously, I, I have some confidence problems. I, I, <laughs> okay, I hear you. I hear um, you. And uh, I, I know. <laughs> Man, fuck all you guys. <laughs> Listen, that's I how I feel. I yeah, that's how it's 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 a it's. He's never <laughs> no, it's, it's yeah. Either has she. So it's hard for people that aren't addicts to understand. Like there was okay. There's just there's, Listen, just, I, there's I have, one. I have I have I have things I deal with. I mean, I'm not. I do. Like it's hard to look like this. It's hard. Like life's not easy. You look like this. Like you know, people people constantly women call you all the time. <laughs> it's you know, people want to just give you money. People just you know, I mean. It's hard to look away from mirrors. Oh, I have issues. Yeah, yeah. I have an addiction. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. I it's, hear you. There, there was there was one story that. Uh, so <laughs> this is so I, not how you thought this was gonna go. I, I but I love this. It's funny. This is fun. Um, there there was uh, she she asked me. She was like, so why didn't you like like when you would get your drugs? Why don't you just wait till you get home? She is the girlfriend. That I'm telling this to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, because these guys don't know that there's a girl. There's yeah. a girlfriend over here that looks yeah. like she just got off a got off a boat from Norway. Yeah. Um, blonde hair, blue eyed, fair skin, yeah. very pretty, tall, Tatted. whole thing. She's yeah, Viking. Viking. Yeah. 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 Straight Nordic. Yeah. Um. So I, <laughs> she asked me that. She's like, "Why don't you just wait until you get home till you did your drugs?" And like. To to somebody that's not an addict, like yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, well, but to an addict, you like once you get your drugs, you fucking want it now. You're yeah. gonna do. I'm gonna pull over and I'm gonna put it in my fucking jugular vein. Like that's that's just how I was wired. That's how I am. No, but that's how that's how you know all all of them are like that. Yeah, and uh, so, like they're they're not, you like pick up the drugs at the at the drug dealer's house and can't make it the the four miles to get home. No, fuck no. I'm doing it right there. Then yeah, it's uh. Okay. Anyways, that, 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 that was conversation. that one. That was yeah. It. yeah. So halfway house failed um, the UA. Failed the UA, and uh, I sh I was like, so when am I gonna go back? And she's like, uh, honestly, I I don't know. Probably another week before we can get you processed. And I was like, oh, that's cool because by then I'll have Here. two days left. Yeah. <laughs> so that'll be the plane flight <laughs> there. Yeah. And back. Yeah. So they it was it was literally like six days later. They're like, okay, yeah, you need to go back since you failed your UA. So I go to Anchorage. Are you serious for two days? I go to so An stupid. I go to Anchorage jail for two days, and so I thought that I was gonna get like a. Uh, I thought they were gonna give me. Shit, what's it called? A, just like a write up, like where they could take away your good time. Right. They could. I so I I oh, yeah. managed to. They were they were going to give me a write up for for failing the UA while I was at the UA or at the halfway house. But they suspended a sen uh, uh, didn't you said they suspended a year or something like that? It was two year yeah two years one suspended. So can't they now give you that or that's if you commit another crime not not a, a failure of a UA? No no they they could they could take away my good time though. Okay. So, which I would, I accrued good. I had never gotten in trouble. So, yeah. they, they could have been like, oh, well, I'm going to give you another seven days. But I beat I beat the paperwork out the door, so to speak. So, like, they were getting ready to process and be like, hey, you know, you, know, you got in trouble for getting uh, failing your UA. And, but I beat it out the door. So, I, I walk out of Anchorage Jail and uh, I get a plane ticket. And, and then I, I get back to Fairbanks and um no gate money no gate money this time <laughs> no nothing uh and i didn't have i didn't have anywhere to go i i mean at that point i i had really had no contact with with anybody um what, what mom and dad no done no they didn't they didn't trust me i mean obviously yeah yeah with all the shit um so i walked to uh from the airport there's there's a a friend of mine, Luke, that lived pretty close there. 
And, uh, I mean, I just walked up and he was like, well, you just got out of jail, didn't you? I was like, yeah, and I don't, I, li- I don't have anything. I don't I have the clothes on my back and that's it. And I was like, can I like try to reestablish something here? Why can I stay with you? He's like, yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. And, uh, still I, <laughs> after still going through all this shit, I still wasn't ready. I still didn't come to the realization that drugs are fucking up my life and that I I had a problem. Um, So I'm on four years of probation now from my second felony, uh, state probation. And now in the story or now? In the story. Yeah, I've been I've been off state and federal probation for a few for a few years now. Um and I, I'm staying with him, and uh, I get a car from somebody, and then I met s- somebody in jail that got out at the same time, around the same time I did, and I saw him, and he looked like shit, and obviously he was on drugs, and I asked him where he can get it, obviously, and I just, it's totally... um absolutely insane uh, to to think that like I can continue to do what I was doing and make something of myself like I'm, I'm fucking just hurting myself so like I called my mom and she she met me in town it was after I got out of state state prison and uh she was crying. She's happy to see me and everything. She's like, you know, I, I wish I could take you home, but we we just we can't. Right. We can't right now. Uh, you need to. You just. You need to figure it out. Um. And it took after. So the way that um, Alaska's uh, probation is, you get um, your first um, PTR uh, petition to revoke probation. You get three days. Your second is five days. Your third is 10 days. After you get your fourth, you can get up to the rest of your time. So after my first two weeks of being out, I already had my first PTR for um, uh, failed UA. And then second one, I was like out of area or something. I wasn't where I was supposed to be. All right. Um, the third one, uh, I was, where was I? I was walking down, I think it might've been university or airport road. And it was still like uh, probably 20, 30 below. And uh, I had found a truck that I was, I had keys i had a lot of keys that i acquired through found a truck i found uh well i was keeping an eye on a truck on this in this parking lot that uh that i may or may not have been able to steal and that my idea was is that i'm going to take this and i'm going to take to my dealer and the pawn shop yeah pawn the truck on the truck yeah and uh a uaf uh, it's a university of fairbanks police they stop, put their light on me, and they're like, are you Lalonde? And I was like, <laughs> what, are you infamous? Uh, no. <laughs> like, I, my, my PO, dude, she, <laughs> bless her heart, she, she, she really wanted the, uh, she was really trying to help me, and I just didn't want the fucking help. I didn't, I was a fucking maniac in my own head, and I didn't, I didn't want anybody's help. I was committed to just fucking getting high fuck everybody else um my life's not worth living like we were joking about earlier but that's how i felt um so this is my third uh probation violation so i'm about to if i get one more i'm gonna get the rest of my time i'm i'm not trying to do another fucking year like i'm like i'm done with this shit and uh are (laughs) you I'm yeah. You know, it doesn't sound like you are. I mean, it uh, yeah. sounds like you want to go back. But yeah. yeah, okay, I hear you. And uh, so they pick me up, and I'm on doing my ten days, and then on my ninth day, 
Uh, I, I call. Are you still staying with your buddy? Yeah. Like he's still, you keep going to jail, coming back, sleeping on the couch? Yeah. Fuck that. <laughs> I'd be like, bro, done. It's your shit. I know. It's in bags. Yeah. He, but unfortunately, I mean, he's been through a lot of the same shit that I was. And like, he, he helped. But I mean, also in the same sense, he was also en- enabling me, of course. Right. And uh, on my ninth day, I had this old fucking native dude. He had uh, um, revolver tattoos on each arm. And then he had like his feather tattoos like up here. And he had really long gray black hair, like really like hardcore. What you would, if you think of a native, that's what he looked like. Super skinny. And uh, I was, I was talking to him and he uh, he he said that he he knew my dad and uh he's like your dad you know he kind of he saved my life i was like what do you mean he's like he he saved my life by by showing me that there's there's more to life than you know just drinking or drugging your life away and uh he's like what would it take what's it going to take for you or what are you willing to do to to get clean and i was like at this point anything anything i will do anything and he's like okay well remember that remember you're willing to do anything to get clean and so i call um i can call my counselor to go to go upstairs so i can use their phone because it's my ninth ninth day i'm about to get out and they need to know where 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 are you staying yeah where are you going yeah what's your address when you get out what are you gonna do and i told her i was like i don't i don't have anywhere she's like well you gotta have something so I call my dad and uh, I was like, dad, um, I, I'm at the point in my life where if I get out of here, I'm, I'm going to overdose. I'm going to die. Uh, I'm going to, I'm either going to die by overdose or I'm just, I'm going to do something else stupid and I'm going to end up just doing the rest of my, I'm going to do more time and I'm going to continue down this path that I, I feel like I'm do not want to do anymore. Um, I, I want to change and I need your help. And, uh, he goes, I, I was kind of, I, I was expecting that call. I was expecting for you to call and I was talking to mom about it. And, uh, he's like, what time, what time are you getting out tomorrow? I was like, 8 PM. He's like, all right, well, I'll be there. I was like, Phew. okay. Um, I appreciate it. Like, thank you. Um, so I get out and he's sitting there waiting and he's stoic. That was the word that I was trying to find a long time ago. Very stoic. And uh, he's, he's hard to read um, because he's, he's, he's very, just, he's mellow. Like he, it's, he's easy to talk to. Um, but that whole ride there, it was, it was very quiet. And he's like, you know, and it was towards like when we were getting home, he's like, you know, there's going to be a lot of rules. And there's going to be a lot of things that you're going to have to do to show and prove us that you're willing to do anything to get and stay clean, you know? <clears throat> so that's, that's what I did. I, I got plugged into a support network and people like-minded people that uh, have the same problems. The AA or? Um, I just, uh, just a 12, 12 step kind of deal. Um, and uh, I got, to to realize and, and see that like I had a, an old friend from like high school at the time he had uh, like five years clean and then some other dude that I used to get high with he had like three years clean and then another old buddy of mine had seven or eight years and I was they're like on their they they have houses and they have like wives now like i feel like I've, i'm so behind on life after doing all this shit like they're they're so far ahead of me and i'm i'm comparing what i'm doing is i'm, yeah. I'm comparing their outsides to my insides what i'm doing like i'm just seeing all this stuff that they have uh that they've acquired and getting down on myself but i uh i got plugged in and i did i went to these support meetings and stuff for every single day for uh they they recommend doing like a 90 and 90 but i think i did probably 140 or something every every single day and then uh i just kept going 
and eventually like built trust obviously back into my parents and i uh i after going to those and like really kind of digging deep into myself and realizing my fucked up thinking and thinking that i'm so so unique and so different than every everybody else i really wasn't and uh that i just i have a fucking problem that i'm going to deal with for the rest of my life i just need to learn to keep it at bay um and uh so that was that's over three and a half years ago now so i've been without any substance for over three years coming up on four years on december 2nd yeah you moved to florida i moved to we moved to florida a year and a half ago um never never moved anywhere else never been anywhere else we were both born and raised in north pole fairbanks alaska and uh at first like we mostly her wanted to go to florida mm-hmm. uh, and um she was looking at tallahassee and i was like uh, we talked to a few people and they're like that's ah, just a big college town you don't want to go there and then but we knew that going further south it's going to be more expensive and at the time i mean we, we didn't have a lot of money but we just we had enough to get the fuck out and uh, i was like well why don't we try you know jacksonville and then we got there and <laughs> realized that it's uh, i mean not what it's all i mean it's kind of the hood it's kind of hood up yeah, there yeah um so now we're planning our ne- next escape yeah uh but it was it's i was been on probation since i was pretty much 18 years old I wasn't allowed to leave the fucking state. And right. I'm a lot now. I'm 33, and I want to, you know, figure out like I want to. I want to travel. I want to see what there is out there. I, I want. I want to experience life, because I'm a little late now because I fucked up between all my 20s and everything, and uh, that's that's what where we're at now. That's a, that's what I'm trying to do. Is I'm trying to figure out like where where I fit, where I sink in, and I ended up getting. Uh, my first first year sober it's a it's called a forensic peer specialist um it's w- helping people that are incarcerated find uh other opportunities get their insurance like food stamps and try to help them out because they've never d- done that shit before mm-hmm. and then i got my cdc one chemical dependency counselor uh level one and that was that was my main that's what i wanted to do when we came here and i had like seven or eight interviews with rehabs and as soon like right after that they're like i want you we we want you yes and they were like what's how's your record and i told them what's on there and I, how how long ago and they're like oh that shouldn't be an issue i mean i have no, i'm not a violent but i don't have right. violent crimes none of that shit and uh yeah it's one of the few careers where it's an attribute yeah I- like i mean they want people with lived experience like trust me i've lived it like i know what it feels like and then they'd be like well uh you have to be off probation for longer than this or blah 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 yeah oh really yeah so he can't work in any of those fields until this summer. yeah so i mean so well what are you doing now right now i i mean i work at a performance shop uh, engine shop uh i'm kind of i mean what my boss calls me is the conductor. Uh, I mean, I'm just the the service writer, the conductor, the manager. Uh, I mean, I just, I make sure that everything on, we have a machine shop side, then we have a mechanic side. And then, so we have an engine builder and then people that do all the machinists on the head. And, and then I, one of the machinists actually just a few days ago, he's like, Hey, we want to show you how to build this. And I was like, yeah, sure. So we do a lot of performance stuff, and and then we do the mechanic, just basic fucking your brakes, your oil change, whatever the fuck. Um, but that's that. That's just is what I'm doing now. Like that's, right. that's just what's keeping me afloat. It's uh, I mean, it's it's not what my heart desires. Right. I don't think. Um, I mean, I enjoy it, uh, but it's not. That's not my calling. Right. Like I I, ha- I have a calling for something, and I still have yet to figure it out. Um, the, <laughs> there it is yeah stay at home dad but you won't let me have kids with you yet <laughs> so well stop taking your birth control <laughs> so right now basically we're wrapping up anyway you're yeah. you're 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 living in florida mm-hmm. 
um, you're, you know, you're, you're waiting out the time for you to reapply and be a, a I'm going to say drug treatment specialist. What do you call it? A chemical dependency counselor. Yeah, it does sound better than lunch lady, right? It sounds like, a, what is it like? What do they call them? Nutritional specialist. Yeah. Right. Not exactly. All right, so that's a good one. That's good. What is it called? Chemical dependency counselor. Important. Doesn't it? Um <laughs> just like, like, stop, come on. <laughs> just playing. Jesus. Um bro, it's 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 difficult. It is to, to these fucking chicks, you know? Yeah. They're 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 a pain, mm, really. I, yes. You know. Um so yeah. Uh <laughs> Yeah. So uh, okay. So cool. So you're 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 doing okay, right? Mm-hmm. You're doing good. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing doing the clean thing, and uh, I I mean, I don't have the uh, the the want <laughs> to 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 dive into that uh, that world anymore. It's just I mean I don't want to say I've grown out of it or something. Or it's 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 something that you got to take day by day. I mean, I, I just want to be better than I was the person that I was yesterday. Like I'm slowly, you know, slowly but surely, you know, I'm trying to get my life back on track. I'm pretty sure that I've done, I mean, I'm worlds apart from where I was. When I tell people the, like the shit that I've been through that I used to shoot up meth and heroin and my jugular and fucking all this stuff, they're like, I can never see you doing that. Right. Like, there's, there's no way, like you didn't do that. I was like, yeah, I mean, I got track marks, to prove. well, not anymore, but I, I, I just, I mean, it's a, a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing. Like, uh, it's nobody, when I get, when I was doing uh, drugs and stuff, and like, I mean, it's uh, it, I was a horrible person. Horrible. And I have no, um, no want to, to ever be that way again. It's uh, terrible, really. I, I just... I gotcha. I got to take it day by day, and I don't want to. I don't want to be like that. I'm. I'm trying to trying to create something with somebody that I love, and uh, she's back in Jacksonville. Oh, oh yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Yeah, and uh, that's. I mean, like, 33. I mean, you figure. I feel. I feel like I should be getting my shit together and and getting life started and that's you know that's kind of my goal is i i don't want to be in jacksonville anymore that's for sure um i want to get back over to maybe like the northwest somewhere uh where they can have four seasons and you don't walk outside and instantly start sweating um yeah somewhere up there not not back to alaska though i don't yeah i can't do that shit i lived in tennessee for about a year and a half it's nice. Is it? Yeah. They get snow in Tennessee? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Not well, not much. No. You know, they don't get much. You yeah. get, and maybe only for a month or so, a month yeah. or two. But, uh, yeah, but it's nice. Yeah. I had a, I had a snow plowing company while I was in, in Alaska. And, I mean, shit, I, I raked in a lot of money doing that. A lot. Like, all you got to do is have a plow and a truck. That's it. And do commercial and and uh, residential driveways. <clears throat> I think there's enough snow. No, no, no. That's why I want to go for like further, further northwest, like uh, Montana, or Utah, Colorado. Colorado is kind of expensive, but listen, there's drug addicts everywhere. Yeah, there is. That's why I got to stay away from them. <laughs> or I thought you were, or, you were supposed to be a counselor. Yeah, gonna... I was, that's what I say. Or help them. Yeah. If yeah. if if I ever find a place that's willing to, I mean, they... I don't think that's a, that's going to be an issue. I think it's getting off probation. I, I've been on probation. Oh, I mean, sorry, the the the, the length of time. Yeah. The, how was it? Four years. It's six or it was six or seven years. Yeah, and I'm coming up on coming up on seven. Yeah. Yeah. So Jeez. I just I I just need to keep plugging along and I just you know keep the drive and cause everybody that I that I talked to that I did the interview with too um that said then when they said that they wanted me they're like just don't just because. You have more one more year to wait. Don't let that fucking fade. Like you have it in you. Like you that you have you have 
the want to help people and we can see it and we want that kind of person. We want the person with lived experience that's been through it because nobody wants to talk to somebody that's not an addict or hasn't had a drug problem yeah. and book read and diagnose them with something or be or this is you can't relate to somebody right. that way. 